If we could come to order, please. <clears throat> it's nine o'clock. I'd like to welcome everyone to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Manatee County Planning Commission for Thursday, March 14th, nine o'clock. If you'd please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. If we go, I'll take a moment and silence our phones. That would be appreciated. Ms. Greer, Ms. Shank, start out with any updates or changes to the agenda. Go ahead. The update was published last night, so nothing since last night that was updated for public record. Nothing, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. We have minutes that have been previously sent to you for February 8th, 2024. Chair will entertain a motion for approval. We have a motion. We have a second for approval. Go ahead and vote. <clears throat> motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right, at this time, we take up citizen comments for future agenda items. This is a time if any citizen would like to come forward and talk about something for future agenda items, not for something that's on today's agenda, but something that you'd like the planning commission and or planning staff to talk about in the future. So is there anyone that would like to come forward and bring forward future agenda items? Seeing no one come forward, we'll close that portion. Thank you. Advertised pub public hearings, um, advertised public hearings, presentations upon request. These are presentations which are usually brief in their, um, in their nature. And number one, we'll start with number one. Ms. Greer, would you please read this into the record? Yes, sir. LDCT 2312 Ordinance 2407, County Initiated Land Development Code Text Amendment for Food Trucks. It's amending the Land Development Code Chapter 2 in the definitions, Chapter 4 zoning, Chapter 5 standards of accessory and specific uses of structures, and Chapter 10 transportation management to define the use of food trucks. Ms. Mr. Chair. Ms. Shank. Okay. Um, sorry. Yeah, I just want to give a brief synopsis. You had seen this before, and the reason it's coming back to you is that subsequently we discovered the Florida legislature decided the preemption should apply to food trucks. So, it, but their preemption doesn't prohibit us from having um, regulations on zone districts or food truck parks. This is what this does. It just says that we can't prohibit them countywide. Apparently some local government tried to prohibit them, and here we got the statute. So um, Mr. Andrews did um, pare down the regulation to only focus more on the food truck parks because that's where there could be some adverse effects off-site. He's here for any details. We're just trying to explain why it's coming back to you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Schenk. Would staff like to offer a presentation for this item? Since there's, you are the applicant. <clears throat> Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners. Hi, Charles Andrews, uh, planner with the Comprehensive Planning Division here. And thank you very much. So real quick, just to show you, and like uh, Ms. Shank had alluded to, this has already come before the commission and the board. And I'm just going to say basically what has changed. So the terminology we changed from mobile vending to food trucks to follow Florida Statute 509.102 regarding uh, mobile food dispensing vehicles. And then we just revised the definition of food trucks to mirror Florida Statute. And then there's the definition before you. And that's it. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Is there anyone in the public that would like to come forward and speak for or against this item? Anyone in the public that would like to come forward and speak for or against this item? <clears throat> Seeing no one come forward, we'll close the um, public <coughs> discussion part of it. Chair will undertake a motion or have comments. I just have a real oh, quick Ms. typo. Ms. Keba, I'm sorry. Sorry. Just a, a little typo under H. It should be shall not, not shall not to. Just a tiny little typo under H. Good job. I'm sorry, under one, well, what section? I'm sorry. Um, under H, and I don't have it in front of me, it's just my notes, it, it should read shall not, not shall not to. It's just this little typo. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Chair, I'll entertain a motion. 
We have a motion. We have a second. You may vote now. Motion's pa motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Ms. Greer, item number two. Item number two, PDO 2331ZG, Gatso Rezone. Uh, Joseph Gatso is the owner. It's a quasi-judicial. Chris Claypeck is here for the planner. It's a rezone of approximately 0.88 acres, generally located west of Tamiami Trail and east of the Intercoastal Waterway and commonly known as 365 Braden Avenue, uh, Ms. Sarasota. Mr. Chair, we should probably swear witnesses at this point. Oh, I'm sorry. Would the clerk, if you're thinking about speaking today, if anyone's even remotely thinking, if you might get moved, it might, lightning might hit you and you want to speak today, please stand up and get sworn in at this moment. Otherwise, we'll have to do this all again. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schenk, for reminding me of that. Um, is the applicant here? If so, let's just do a, this is um, um, non-controversial, so let's just do a very incredibly brief presentation, Mr. Schmidt. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Planning Commissioners. For the record, my name is Bob Schmidt with Land Planning Associates, and I have been sworn. Uh, this is a rezone to PDO to establish, or to create a zoning district uh, to allow the continuance of established re uh, residential support use at this location. Uh, and so there's really nothing changing here, just asking for your formal approval. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schmidt. Um, staff, anything to add from staff? Good morning. Chris Klepek with Development Services. I have been sworn. Uh, don't really have a whole lot to add uh, to that one. There are uh, a couple specific approval requests. I'd just like to run through them very briefly. So there's four of them. Um, there's a existing garage located on the eastern portion of the of the property. Um, this property was built out in the late mid to late 60s. Um, as such, there's an existing encroachment of the side yard setback when coming into a PDO zoning district. So with that being said, uh, there's specific approval requests to allow for the the existing encroachment to continue, as well as the buffer reduction um, that would that would go alongside with that one as well. Um, the reduction is from 15 feet to 8 feet, and the buffer would be 10 feet to 8 feet. Um, this is also located within the entranceway, so entranceway criteria does uh, require for cross access be provided, as everything's already existing in there. Um, it's just kind of a formality to, to come forth with a spe uh, specific approval request to, to allow for the cross access to not be put in. Um, as well as the variable with roadway buffer. Um, there's some parking that happens that takes place on the site for the existing driveway. So it's just to allow for the continuation of, of the use. I'd be happy to ask, answer any other questions. Thank you. Any questions for staff at this point? Thank you. <clears throat> we'll open the public comment portion of this thing. Is there anyone in the public that would like to come forward and speak for or against this item? Anyone in the public to speak for or against this item? We'll close the public comment portion. Any closing comments by staff? Anything from the applicant? Chair will entertain a motion. We have a motion. We have a second to approve. We have a motion and a second. You may go ahead and vote. I, it's frustrating. We do all this electrically. We used to just say I and all that stuff. That's why we're sitting here staring at blank screens. <laughs> so I we're not ignoring you. It's just got to wait for it to happen. There we go. I don't have everyone voting yet. It's not popped up yet. Oh, there we go. All right. Uh, motion to approve, approved uh, unanimously. Thank you. Item number three, Ms. Greer, would you please read this one into the record? <clears throat> Z2312, Saltzman Distribution Substation, Peace River Electric Cooperative, Inc. is the owner. It's quasi-judicial. We have Loretta Merrill here, here for staff if you need a presentation. Zoning within the unincorporated area, providing a rezone of approximately five acres, generally located 
3,600 feet north of the intersection of Moccasin Wall Road and US 301 on the west side of US 301 in Parrish. From PDR, Planned Development Residential, to the A1 um, zoning district. All right, thank you, Ms. Greer. Is the applicant present? Good morning, Sean Lyons. I'm a professional engineer with AM Engineering. Uh, I have been sworn. Uh, it's been a long time since I've made a presentation up here, but it's good to see some familiar faces. Um, Ms. Greer pretty much covered everything on this uh, substation. Peace Rivers owned the property since 2007, and they, they now see a, a desperate need to get this substation uh, put in place to serve the area. So I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Any questions for the applicant at this point? Nope. Thank you. Staff Thank you. presentation. Good morning, Loretta Merrill. I have been sworn. Um, I don't really have anything to add. Like I said, it's a straight rezone to A1. They need a substation here, and they own the property. So. Okay. All right. Any questions for staff? We'll open the public comment section. Is there anyone in the public that would like to come forward and speak for or against this item? Anyone in the public to speak for or against this item? Seeing no one come forward, we'll close public comment. Chair will entertain. Oh, closing comments by staff. Closing comments by the applicant. Chair will entertain a motion. I've got to go to motions. Uh, we have a motion by, we have a motion and a second. <laughs> To approve. I don't have a voting screen yet. I still don't have a voting screen. So um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Aye. Thank you. Item number four, Ms. Greer, would you please read this into the record? PDR 2336ZG, Hine Rutland Road, PDR, Manatee Property L LDT. Manatee Property LDT is the owner. It's quasi judicial, and Kevin Oatman is here for staff. It's a rezone on approximately five acres from A to the PDR zoning district, generally located approximately 1.25 east of Highway 301, south of Rutland Road, and east of 136 Terrace East commonly known as 13755 County Road 675 Parish. And it's approving a general development plan of approximately 15 single-family residential detached, attached, and semi-detached dwelling units. All right. Thank you. Um, applicant. And Mr. Chair, we have to disclose ex parte communication. Uh, has anyone had any ex parte communication on this item? No. Good morning, Planning Commissioners. For the record, Ria Lopez with RVI Planning and Landscape Architecture, and I have been sworn. Um, would you like a full presentation? We do have one prepared. If, if not, I can provide I would, it. I would hit the high points. Sure. Where is it? What is it? Um, of course. All right, so I'll, I'll just run through a few slides of my presentation, and we do have a team of consultants present for any uh, nuanced questions as well. Uh, so our request is related to a five-acre property located on Rutland Road and 136 Terrace East. Uh, the site has uh, frontage on two roadways, as you can see on the aerial map. Currently, there are five residential units developed on this property, which is uh, an, uh, a legally existing non-conforming use. The property is in the Urban Fringe 3 Future Land Use District and is currently zoned General Agricultural. Um, if you see the context of this project, it is in an area which is rapidly transitioning from agricultural uses into suburban-style residential development. So this project is one such um, you know, endeavor to uh, convert previously agricultural or um, you know, low-density residential land uses into a suburban residential subdivision. Our request is to rezone the property to planned development residential. We are seeking a maximum of 15 homes. Uh, which would be under the gross uh, density of three dwelling units to an acre permissible within the UF3 future land use district. 
We're requesting for single family detached, attached, and semi-attached unit types. This is because this rezone is being undertaken by the property owner, and they wish to have flexibility to determine final use at a later stage. Uh, we will be restricting height to two stories in order to ensure compatibility with the surrounding areas. And we are also proposing perimeter buffering consistent with the LDC requirements, as well as in excess of those requirements in some instances. So this is just an overview of what we intend the site to be developed as. We'll be providing for right-of-way reservation on Rutland Road, as well as roadway bufferings around, along both uh, roadways. We are also providing the 10-foot required green belt. And to the southern boundary, there is a cemetery. And based on input received from the public at the neighborhood meeting, we've enhanced that buffer to be a 15-foot wide enhanced buffer. Um, we've also organized the site such that the storm water will be oriented along Rutland Road, providing a larger setback from uh, that thoroughfare roadway. And then finally, the site will provide the required 25% open space uh, you know, that is required for all PDR districts. Again, the site is in the UF3 future land use district, as is all of its surrounding areas as well, which is designated for development uh, at three dwelling units to an acre. And we are requesting that maximum uh, density at 15 dwelling units. We have one specific approval request in our uh, application, and that is uh, related to corner lots. Uh, for corner lots, we are seeking that the secondary front yard, which does not contain the driveway, has, uh, is treated as a side yard and provided with a, a reduced side setback of 10 feet. Uh, the site is well served by public facilities. There is um, you know, existing transportation facilities. Any off-site improvements needed to those will be determined by the traffic uh, analysis uh, completed in detail at the uh, preliminary site plan or final site plan stage. <coughs> Utilities are available in the vicinity as well. Uh, further, par uh, the parish fire district can provide fire services and Mantee County will provide EMS services to this project as well. Um, finally, the project is also consistent with the Manatee County Comprehensive Plan. There are uh, several policies related to the UF3 Future Land Use District, which we are consistent with. And we also uh, meet several of the other policies within the Comprehensive Plan related to development that is west of the future development area boundary in an area that is uh, rapidly developing, as well as served with public facilities and services. So in conclusion, our project is uh, consistent and compatible with the surrounding land use pattern. There is available infrastructure to support this development. The site has been sensitively designed for protection of views from adjacent roadways and properties. It is consistent with the Manti County uh, Comprehensive Plan as well as the Land Development Code. And with that, we respectfully request for your recommendation for approval. And uh, my team and I are here to answer any questions. Thank you. Have any commissioners had any ex parte communications on this item? Yes, please. No, thank you. Any questions for the applicant at this time? Staff presentation. Good morning, Chairman, Board. My name is Kevin. I'm with Development Services, and I've been sworn in. I just wanted to add, she, uh, Ms. Lopez covered pretty much all the details of the information provided for you. I just wanted to add that there would only be one access to this development from the 136 terraced road. Um, and that proposed access is spaced or distance from the Rutland Road. So therefore, it's not going to really cause any um, backed up traffic, I believe, off, you know, concerning the Rutland Road. That's pretty much all I wanted to add to it. Thank you. Any questions for staff at this point? We'll open the public comment portion of this, of the hearing. Is there anyone in the public that would like to come forward and speak for or against this item? Please come forward. State your name and county of residence. Michael Fox, Manatee County. I have been sworn in. Uh, my name is Michael Fox. I live at 6831, 136 Terrace East in Parish, um, across from the development, proposed development. My family has lived here since May 2019. 
I am against the development of the 15 homes going in on the three acres in front of my home. Uh, I don't understand why we can't have five, six, maybe nice homes there, which was proposed in the beginning. Um, most properties in this area are two to three acres and above, and you're gonna put 15 homes on three acres. Doesn't make much sense to me. Uh, I know there's not a lot I can do to stop this development, but I have a major issue with the entrance point being on in front of my driveway on 136. Uh, the street of 136 Terrace is already too narrow um, for two cars to pass at the same time. It's, a, it's about a lane and a half. Uh, so that obviously is going to be an issue, a traffic issue. Um, I would like for them to put a turning lane on 675 or an entrance on 675 to get into this development. Uh, leaving 136 in the morning is already an issue to turn on to 675. Uh, it takes three to four minutes before you can get a clearing to even exit that 136th street. Uh, and if you add 15 homes across the street, 15 homes is going to bring 30 cars to this neighborhood, which is going to cause a major traffic jam on 136. Um, not to mention there are many kids in the neighborhood that stand at the bus stop in the morning at the intersection of 675 and 136. Um, 136 is a quiet street with very little traffic. Um, why should there, why should I have to watch cars constantly come in and out of the development right in front of my property entrance? My children will no longer be able to play safe at the end of the road or the driveway. The entrance would make more sense on 675 on 136. And 136 would definitely have to be widened to allow incoming and ongoing traffic. As I said, I'm sure I can't say enough to stop the development, but I'm really concerned with the entrance being right in front of my house. Um, 675, I think, would be a better option. And also, if you could reconsider the amount of homes uh, from 15 on three acres to try to match the neighborhood better. That's all. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Is there anyone else in the public that would like to come forward and speak for or against this item? Anyone in the public? We'll close the public comment portion, staff closing comments. Or any questions from staff? Well, staff closing comments. No staff closing comments? Applicant closing comments. Thank you, Chair. I, I just wanted to note one thing in response to the gentleman's public comments. So uh, when we did come in with this project, we were trying to put an access onto Rutland Road um, because it is the major thoroughfare. Uh, but that being said, it would not meet the intersection separation requirements uh, to the intersection. And so our required access has to be on 136 Terrace uh, Roadway, and that's that's where we have it proposed as well. Uh, our project will also commit to any of the roadway improvements that are identified when we complete a traffic impact analysis at the detailed en engineering stage. So we, we do understand that there may be some improvements required, and, and our project will commit to uh, complete those at that stage. Thank you. Question. Um, so 675 is a county road, correct? Yes. Yes. And so the distance separation between the intersection and where you could put an entrance is a county levied requirement. Yes, distance it is. requirement, correct? Yes, it is. Okay. So we could get, you could get a specific approval to put the entrance there with um, a reduced distance. Yes, and I believe we had uh, discussed this with staff right at the pre -app. They had asked sure, us to. Sure, but um, you could, it's not a state road. Not it a it is road. not a state road. It is a county, county controlled. Road. Yes. Okay. So just to be clear, so that we, the county, are saying we're not going to enter on 675. We're going to force this to enter off 136th. Yeah, that, that's what is, uh, you know, right. what was, what's the outcome of uh, staff review and so on. <clears throat> a couple of comments. <clears throat> Sorry. This is a GDP, correct? Yes, it is. So on your GDP, you're indicating the pond to be on the north side. Yes. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. So... I, I have sympathy with the gentleman who doesn't want the entrance that far south across from his garage, which I wouldn't want that either. 
So is there a reason you're not flipping that, putting the pond on the south, putting the entrance towards the north, and then using the pond as a buffer to the neighbors? Right. So again, this was an outcome of the distance requirement. So based on uh, the intersection spacing even required from uh, the intersection of Rutland Road and 136 Terrace to where our entrance is, that is the minimum distance that we have to provide per the public work standards. So uh, unfortunately, our entrance has to be on the southern corner of our project. That, that is the minimum spacing. We've, we've not put it at, at the southern end. It is just uh, the required spacing there again. I'll be looking for staff to come up and discuss that in a little bit about how many other projects in Manatee County don't have that kind of clearance from the road to the entrance. Um, the side yard setback, I'm a little concerned about that. Is that precedent setting? Usually on a corner lot, you have two fronts and two sides. So um, staff may also want to comment on that. Are we now setting a precedent going forward that now we're just not going to have the two, the two fronts and we're just going to go with whatever we want? Uh, I understood. This, this uh, specific approval has been um, you know, present on several other projects as well. So currently, for a corner lot, uh, two sides, uh, you, know, you do count it as two fronts and two sides. And so the front, front setback would be 20 foot on, on both sides. But for the area that includes the driveway, that kind of spacing isn't, uh, is required. But the one without the driveway is, is, is essentially a side yard. And that's where we are seeking for the reduced uh, side setback, but not to the extent of uh, a typical side setback. That's why it's an intermediate setback of 10 feet. Well, I wish I would have done that all on my projects because it would have saved me lots in land. I didn't know. I was always doing front yard, front yard, side yard, side yard. Ms. Greer, any comments on that? Or am I just totally wrong? It's actually more the norm to do it this way than the exception, yes. Well, yay. All right. yeah. Look how stupid am I? So um, it, it's that. Just want to make sure we were in precedent setting. Talked about 130. So the the width of 136 is going to be decided probably at FSP level, and any improvements that 136 is going to need, I'll have staff confirm that at a, in a moment, and we'll also have staff talk about uh, the entrance. Any other questions for staff, Mr. Rutledge? Yes. Uh, so I just wanted to understand: Have you done a charrette moving? Uh, the entrance further away from this individual who is perhaps going to be harmed by this. Have you done charrettes, and, and does that tell you that you get less houses there? And I guess I'm curious whether it's the road that's causing you to make the decision you're making, or is it design cost of housing? Uh, no, so it, it, is, it is the spacing requirement that requires us to put it at the southern end, um, and, and that's definitely how we, we also laid out the site. Um, so... That, that was a, a requirement which, you know, was put out to us by staff up front, and so that's the iteration we've been working with. So you, you weren't aware of this neighbor's concern? Uh, we, we are aware of the concern, but there was no room to move the entrance any, any further. Okay, so I think we're kind of talking around in circles here. So my question for you would be, could you move the entrance without if impacting the number of homes that you need or want or have uh, if the county made the decision to modify on this particular location where that road could go? Uh, potentially, I don't believe we've evaluated uh, what it would look like, but yes, potentially. Right, that was my question to begin with. Have you analyzed it? So you've just done what the county code says, which I understand, but my question is now we have this concern, uh, have you thought about whether you could modify it to address this concern without impacting anything else, except for our code, which we now find out is commonly reconsidered, correct? Uh, so we, we've not done an analysis, but we, we potentially could look into um, if the county was willing to allow us a reduced separation, that is something we can evaluate. I'm sure the county will be back, right? Can you do me a favor, and that is in your presentation, sorry, I'm sorry, um, in your presentation, you had a colored little site plan. Can you yes. bring that up? Of course. I like that for a couple of reasons. First of all, just so we know, as a planning commission, we're not approving this colored site plan. It's simply a cartoon. You're approving the general development plan that's in your proposal, your presentation, and that. That's what you're approving. Um, if you go down to, there you go. And I think you had a colored one, not that it really particularly matters. Yeah, it, it, there you um, go. So the issue, Mr. Thing. Rutledge, is that that road, the entrance road off 136, either needs to be at the south end or the north end and nowhere in between. Because otherwise, I got a, I got a turn, I got a circle on both sides. I got a cul-de-sac going to two ends, right? 
So that's, the, that's their problem, I believe, with why it's either here or there and not in between. Um, and that's just kind of a planning issue. Um, and they, they might lose a couple lots if that entrance road had to go in the middle, let's say, and they had to have two cul-de-sacs on both sides. It no doubt would um, um, d d um, lower their yield of lots, but that, that's not necessarily our problem. We're, our problem is good planning. So anyway, I know you want the distance because that's a logical thing. But to the extent that you have an individual, I, I got the. I'm living in the guy's house across the street, and I don't know that I want that road across. I don't know that that's necessarily good planning. So, question, well, Ms. Keba. Um, even if you moved it north, would that affect other people's properties across the road? I mean, uh, are they... and I can pull up the aerial. Look, I'm not trying to, I, I really don't like designing projects from the dais, so I don't really want to wander down this path too far. I'm just not a big, I'm okay in developing this. I'm not a big fan of, and I'm with the guy. I wouldn't want to cross the street either, but it's probably going to happen, so how do I make it better? And having that entrance across from my house and my kids playing out there doesn't seem to be better to me. Now, there's another argument that the person on the corner, right, they're not here, but if I put it across from their house, they're not going to be happy either. So it goes somewhere in the middle. I have two cul-de-sacs on the north and the south. I lose a few lots, and I move ahead. Uh, I don't know. But, and, and that was, sorry. Go ahead, no, 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 That was my question. Have you conceived of other ways to execute this, knowing what we now know? And that, that's kind of my question, because I'm not a designer. Right, and and I can tell you that because we were trying to abide by the county standards on this, sure. this we, we, we genuinely have not evaluated it. Uh, one of the thoughts that, you know, um, I, I'm just having through my head is also that we'll have to provide intersection improvements and so on based on the traffic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, typically the, the spacing requirement that's there from intersections is for, uh, in order to accommodate that. So that's something I just want to note that we haven't evaluated. So again, you know, on the fly to let yeah. you know whether we'd be able to provide it is, is difficult from that standpoint. The other thing I would say is that, you know, I'm, I'm a, commercial developer, and we always do several choices to figure out how it maximizes the site. And all that was not recorded, right? So <laughs> to, to the extent that you review a property, you maximize the performance in yield. You don't maximize the performance for the neighbor. And I'm just asking, is it reasonable to expect that maybe you could consider that at this point? That's my question. And, and you said you didn't? Okay. So should you? Right, so I, I think the way we started, and I can tell you just as an exercise, uh, because our team did this, was that we, we looked at all the requirements, put that together, and, and then started yeah. in that fashion. So, um, um, but that being said, you know, initially we did want the access on, on Rutland Road. That is how our pre-application uh, packet was filed as well, just because it was a major thoroughfare. But once we were told that that's not possible and that we need to meet separation requirements from that intersection, right. um, you know, so we, we definitely went and... Um, Try to evaluate that. All right, let, let, let's focus on this this issue and let's get any input from staff. Is there any variance, any play in the distance from 675 to this entrance, or is it a done deal and we can stop talking about it? Mr. Chair, could you state your question again, please? So, um, the entrance off of 136 is pushed to the south because of county required distances between the entrance and 675. That's what I believe to be true. Is there any play in that? Can we do a specific approval that moves it, or is that absolutely not going to happen and we can just stop talking about it because it's going there no matter what? Okay, Nelson Galeano, Transportation Planning, on I have been served. Um, regarding your, your question about um, the location of the access south of the property, um, this is the, the, okay, let, let me start saying that um, this project will generate only 17 trips during the PM peak hour. It means that it's about one trip every four minutes. From the traffic operational perspective. I, look, I don't, we're not is, interested in that. Is, what is the distance requirement from uh, Rutland to the entrance? Answer that question. Is there any variance there? Yes, sir. The location of uh, uh, entrances depend also on the traffic volumes. That, that's, there are a direct correlation between location and, and traffic values. Okay, regarding the location, is the the, there are possibilities to locate the uh, entrance north of the current proposal location. The, the only 
item that I want to call the attention is the, the although again, as is only for this uh, uh, single family home and this one, there are only one trip per hour. Uh, the purpose is to consolidate accesses fronting each other in order to diminish the conflict points along the roadways. That is essentially the only uh, valid, no valid, um, operational argument to place the access south of the property. It means to diminish the, com the, the number of conflict points uh, along the roadway. Uh, our regulation allows them to put uh, um, the access uh, a little bit northern from the current location, um, but this is a business decision. Uh, All right. And Thanks. just if I could add to that, please, um, based on 675 is probably at some point going to be more than a two lane road. I don't know what that's going to look like, but at some point it may be. And if we consider where the right of way um, will be in the future, there's approximately 400 feet from that point to the rear of the five acre, or it's not five acre, but the track across the street. I'll get you an acreage here. To the other corner lot? Yeah, to the other corner lot. It's about 400 feet. So depending on how many lots they actually propose, we might be amenable to something like that. Hmm. But on 675, it will definitely pose a problem. Thank you, Ms. Greer. Um, so I personally am conflicted because I want to vote for it because it should be developed. Development across the street, it's on 675. They're allowing for the right of way on 675 for future growth and widening, as Ms. Greer said. On the other hand, I'm very sympathetic with the guy who lives on 136, and I don't want the entrance across the whether it's one car an hour or one car per year. I don't want it, and I don't know that that's good planning. However, I don't necessarily want to vote against this thing. What I would like to see is for us to approve it, and between now and you go to the county commission, you rethink what you're doing so that there's a better solution, because now that the county commission might be watching this or hear about this, and they might be asking tougher questions. So um, I'm going to propose that we approve it the way it is, letting everyone know that we're somewhat unhappy with it, and hopefully the county between now and then the applicant will do a better job. Now, that, that was, I'm sorry, that wasn't fair. <laughs> hopefully the applicant and staff will work together on resolving some of these issues. Mr. That's Chair, I'll make sure that staff gets with them and we come up with a solution. Hammer it out to know that okay. those aren't possible. Okay. Can I just add one other thing, too? And I, I appreciate this gentleman coming and has his concerns. And i also like to remember this other person, another person, another individual, has this property that they want to develop to meet the codes that the county has set out. And they've done that. And so I'm a little... So it's hard to punish them. Yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of... You two disagree. You and the... You and the when, yeah, I was just going to say, by the way, I rarely get accused of not being heard. So, uh, Anyway, but my point is this. I, I hear what you're saying. I think it's a good commentary. I understand your position. But I also see a resident of the community who says, I want to do this, and I'm doing everything you tell me. So I, I'm going to vote for it with the assumption that prudent neighbors, good business people, We'll relook at this now that we've talked about what the considerations might be. So I'm going to I'm going to vote for it. All right. Any, are there any other questions for um, staff and or applicant at this point? Okay. Chair will entertain a motion. Then looks like we have a motion to approve. We have a second. You may vote now. See if the summary comes up. The summary is not coming up on this any. There it is. All right. So the motion uh, passes to approve unanimously. And for the gentleman here and anyone else, I, I think we've demonstrated our concern with it. Certainly get with staff and the applicant between now and the board hearing. There'll be a board hearing, whether it's in a month or two months, and certainly show up there and torches and pitchforks again. So um, that that's good. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Schenk. Um, just for the record, so on Got cell number two and source from distribution number three. There are no ex parte communications. Is that correct? I not ask. No. Maybe I, I can't should remember. just. I'm just double checking. Could could we do a global one in the beginning saying? Well, we're supposed to do it for each one in the oh, record. Oh, okay. 
So Sorry. no. So no. <laughs> Can't do. That was good. <laughs> I understand. I wrote it. See, ex parte right there. Because I, I always. <laughs> Tough crowd up here. Tough crowd. <laughs> Isn't it great to be chair? Oh, it's great. Oh, yeah. Mr. Rutledge, didn't you want you this job? That's a newbie, too, right commenting on that. <laughs> all right. And I'll see. All right. Looks like it's number five. Is that correct, Ms. Greer? Would you please read number five into the record for us? PDR 2328 ZP Palm View P Crawl LLC Rezone. It is to, and uh, Barney is here for staff if um if we need a if we need him a rezone of approximately 20.47 generally located on the northwest corner of the intersection of us 41 and 16th avenue east canal road at 5897 16th avenue east and it is a, re a rezone uh from a1 slash cpa to pdr slash cpa zoning district <clears throat> this is in the coastal planning area overlay and um, it is a preliminary site plan for residential development containing 264 multifamily units My God. there we go good morning thank you um, is the applicant here good morning Taylor Faulkner with Blaylock Walters here on behalf of the applicant and I have been sworn we do have a, yep, a little presentation for you this morning. <clears throat> what do we get to? I don't know what is going on with this. I've seen this before. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, I'll give you a little background and maybe our presentation will pop up. But um, this is a request to rezone from A1 to PDR with a preliminary site plan for 264 multifamily residential units and amenity center and associated site plan. The project is located in the northwest corner of US 41 in Canal Road. Oh, there we go. Um, of US 41 in Canal Road, approximately one mile north of the US 19 and US 41 interchange in Palmetto. Here is just an overview aerial of where the site is. Here is a closer view of the site. There is a large wetland on site that the applicant is um, preserving the entire wetland as well as wetland buffers around it. The site has an existing future land use of ROR. There's um, future land use of ROR around it, as well as Res 6 and Res 9. This is the zoning map. Again, it is currently A1. We're requesting a rezone to PDR. To the north, there is a, um, an RV park and some residential uses, single family, as well as a mobile home. To the west, we also have an intense mobile home park. To the east, there is a neighborhood commercial, which is currently vacant. And then to the south, there is a church and some vacant RMF9. This is a colored site plan um, of the project. There are five buildings proposed, a total of 264 units with a density of a nine uh, excuse me, 12.9 dwelling units per acre, which is below the 16 dwelling units per acre allowed in ROR. There are two means of access proposed for the project, one on Palm View Road and one on Canal Road. There's also a third emergency exit um, proposed off of US 41. As I mentioned earlier, there's a large wetland on the site. The applicant will be preserving that entire wetland, there are no wetland impacts proposed, as well as the 30-foot wetland buffer. All of the buffer and setback requirements will be either met or exceeded for this site. Um, we believe that this is an appropriate use for this location. It is consistent and with the Comprehensive Plan and Land Development Code, and we respectfully request your approval 
and we're here happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Have any commissioners had any ex parte communications on this item? See, I, I, I am no. trainable. <laughs> I am trainable, Ms. Schenk. No. no, okay, thank you. Thank you, any questions for the applicant at this point? Uh, I just wanted to identify in the top left-hand corner of your development what that component is. Top left? Well, if you look at the top of your page. The amenity the center. Is, so that's a component only for use by the residents? Yes. And I, one other question, what's your required green space? You have 33%. What, what's your required? We have 67% open space provided. The required is 35%. Okay. One of the things I like when people save more green. Yep. That's all. Okay. Any, any other questions for the applicant at this time? No? Staff presentation? Mr. Salmon, good morning. Good to see you. Good morning. My name is Barney Sam. I have been sworn. Um, I think they took my photos, the applicant. So um, great job. Um, this is a project. They do they, they, the 35% open space is required. They have way more than that. They're preserving the wetland. 30% open. 30% setback. Um, I think the closest um, building is building one to the to the west of the mobile home park. It's like 100 100 feet. So there's they exceed the uh, buffers. Um, and, the, and the setbacks with the whole project. So I don't, it's not much to say, yeah. All right. Any questions for staff at this point? None? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. We'll open the public comment portion of this project. Is there anyone in the public that would like to come forward and speak for or against this item? Please come forward, state your name, that you've been sworn, and your county of residence. Good morning. Name is Larry Gabbard, um, resident of Manatee County, and I have been sworn. Uh, this project is 264 residential units, four stories high. Um, currently, most of the people out there, other than the mobile home parks, are uh, on one to four, five acres plots on Canal Road, which I live on Canal Road. Um, we're looking at possible have impact of 500 vehicles on two two-lane roads, that being Canal and Palm View, which are the two entrances. Uh, none of them, the uh, analysis did say that there was a uh, s signal light down on P uh, Palm View in 41. There is none. Uh, I went there today anyway. And uh, so there is no, uh, there are no signals uh, coming off to in enter 41. Um, if you put that many houses, four stories too, I don't think four stories is compatible uh, with that, along with the fact that when they do the uh, uh, DB reading, uh, hopefully those uh, top floors will pick up all that traffic noise off of 41, which will grow, and uh, we understand that. So we answered our own question. We're still gonna have more growth, so those 500 vehicles are not the end. We're gonna add to that with the growth in that area. And we know we can't stop that. Uh, the impact on Palm View School, uh, K through eight, uh, kids are gonna have to walk. Buses don't pick up that uh, short a distance, I don't think. They're gonna cross the railroad track. Now in the plan, I think they're putting a sidewalk in. That sidewalk's gonna have to cross the railroad track. The buffer zone, uh, I didn't see a fence. I don't know if there is one there, but uh, the kids will be playing in that area a pickleball court, and the dog parks, what I saw as amenities. Uh, where do the kids play? Are they gonna play in the wetlands? That's the only, only open area for them. Or they drive, ride their bicycle in the, in the 500 car parking lot, or they ride them out on Palm View Road, 41, or Canal Road. That's very impactful. I hope we don't set in motion a situation where we're gonna read it in the newspaper and someone got hurt out there, okay? Kids walking in the dark that far? Okay, real fast. Um, the lights are definitely a problem, and what do the children do? I mean, they're not gonna, that's a two-lane road. All, all the interest comes out on two-lane road, 500 vehicles on a two-lane road. Even if you go down to 19, uh, no signal light. If you go down to Bayshore Road, which is the next intersection, no signal light. Uh, we already have heavy traffic out there due to the uh, 
mobile home park and also the RV park, which stays reasonably packed. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to come forward and speak for or against this item? State your name, uh, whether or not you've been sworn, and county residence. Um, my name is Robert Rice. I have been sworn, and I'm in Manatee County. I kind of feel selfish after listening to him because his concern was a little brighter. There we go. You okay? You're good. All right. And uh, I'm analog, not digital, so I can't put all this stuff up here. Okay, so bear with me. Uh, this guy, I have brought up things that I never thought about. My problem is personal in nature. I live, I have the only residence directly across from this thing, the 264 unit deal. It's only, the only thing I don't like is it's got 264 units and then everything that goes along with that. Um, the initial thing, I went to a church and they had a thing set up where they had the main entrance right across from my driveway. That, in fact, it goes through my mailbox. And then, then the, the headlights now in the cars are so bright that it's going to have all these cars coming in and out, shining on my house. I don't, I'm, I'm opposed to it. And my wife and I built a house nine years ago because it was in a secluded area. And I feel like the young man that left that spoke first. The driveway is the big deal, but I don't even want to see it over there. Right now I look out there, I see trees. You know, we have a bobcat that comes through every once in a while. I, I'm, I'm against it, but again, one for the better good of all or whatever. But uh, I would like to, I don't, I don't want to see it. I don't know what to do. It's, uh, I, I know I can't stop it, but the driveway cannot be directly across from my house, please. Like I said, nobody else is directly impacted. I am. Nobody else is that I know of. That's all I can say. All right, thank you. All right. Is there anyone else in the public that would like to come forward and speak for or against this item? Anyone else? We'll close the public comment portion. S staff, comments? Thank you. Um, yes, uh, to... Um, one of the items is the there is no offense, but there is buffering, the 30-foot buffer around the site with landscaping, so there's not a, not a fence going to be proposed. Um, the um, the um, recreation center is only for those that are on site. It's for, it's for those that are their residents, and the, uh, there is a sidewalk required to connect to the school to the west. It's Palm View Elementary, K through 8. That's one of the requirements. We're working on that now. There's some issues with crossing the CSX, but we'll work that out. And one, one item, you, it's, uh, I think the gentleman said that uh, this driveway was directly across the street from his. This drive, we're working on it now. They're working on a design exception for that because um, this one didn't meet the, ex the requirements also, but that'll be worked out during final site plan, uh, at the final site plan. We'll work on the, the details on exactly where that driveway is. It won't change much, but I don't think it'll be lined up right That'll be worked out at, during, the, during the FSP. So you're, um, as I'm looking now at that northwest corner, corner um, enlarged, there's an amenity area, there's a pool called out of 5,200 5, square feet, there's a play area, so there are some amenities on site. And there's a dog park, I know mean, it's not much, but there's a dog park to the, on the south, okay. south and, and that, east um, corner. And the boulevard entrance where it's located certainly could be moved either to the east or the west. It's just into parking lots, so it could be slid a little bit, mm -hmm. um, so it's not right across the street from the gentleman's entrance. And as I looked on the aerial, I mean, you see his house and everything to the east of that is, there's really nothing there. Yeah. So maybe between now and the board hearing, you can work on that yeah. and come yes, up sir. with a better solution. And you said you're working on, um, no. so we don't know what we're gonna do. You're proposing is five foot, not you, Five foot sidewalk along the property line, but then it runs to the west across the tracks, and we don't really have an answer for that yet. We'll work. We're, we're some detail we're working with Mark Barmy, the attorney on on with CSX, working that situation out. It'll be worked out prior to FS with the FSP approval. I'm hoping to have an answer before we go to the board. We will. Um, 
there's two pieces of sidewalk that need to be connected. The one from the site to just on the west side of the railroad track, but there's also a missing piece of sidewalk um, on 61st Street East as you approach, um, sorry, I can't think of the name, I've got it here. Um, oh, Bayshore Road, there's a piece missing. That's also going to be a requirement. Um, we may need to work on the stipulation that's in there a little bit, but that will be a requirement because we anticipate school age children. Mm -hmm. All right. I mean, we pay into a sidewalk fund. I know I've paid into a sidewalk fund for 20, 30 years, and hopefully it goes to things like this. No. Okay. Well, this, the development will pay for the sidewalk for their development. Right. But even running over to the school, you'll, yes. Make, yes. you'll make them do an offsite. Um, all right. Everyone's nodding their head. Yes. Yeah. Woohoo. Okay. Fine. All right. Anything else for staff? Applicant closing comments. Uh, to, we already had a public hearing, but you'll have another chance at the board. And also afterwards, obviously, you know all the players now, so certainly after this, you can meet out in the hallway and have any further discussion. But once we close our public comment area, can't go backwards. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. There are rules and laws and all of that. <laughs> go, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Life's tough, isn't it? <laughs> applicant comments. Yes. Um, as Barney stated, we are working with uh, CSX now on the sidewalk. It will be connected to the sidewalk on Palm Ave that's existing. Um, there's some issues just regarding the actual railroad, whether the sidewalk will go completely over it or rather stop, but that's intended to be resolved at board. Um, <coughs> And the driveway issue, we were aware of that. The driveway has been moved to the east already some, but if we need to continue to look at that, um, we can. But it has been slightly moved already. Okay. Questions for the applicant? Again, just, just uh, based on the discussion we had previously mm -hmm. about being uh, sensitive to the neighbor, uh, Mr. Reif has this concern. It seems like you don't have the same constraints as the previous one, but your attention to mitigating uh, his disappointment would be important. Yes, understood. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant and or staff? If not, Chair will entertain a motion. <clears throat> we have a motion to approve and second. Please vote. It won't let me. Yeah, I know. All right. Oh, Sorry. there it goes. Motion to approve passes unanimously. Thank you. Let's see. Now we go to item number six. Have any planning commissioners had any ex parte <coughs> communications about item number six? No, sir. Mm, I'm sorry? No. No. Okay, good. Ms. Gray, would you please read item number six into the record? PDR 2315ZG, Mia Bella Palmetto, 1955 Palmetto BTR LLC is the owner. It's quasi-judicial. James McDivitt is here for staff. Uh, it's a rezone of approximately 9.1 acres generally located along the south side of 49th Street East and east of 16th Avenue East. It commonly known as 1955 49th Street East Palmetto. From RSF2, to RSF 6, well, I'm sorry, it, it's a rezone from PDR 2 of approximately 8.8 .8 acres and RSF 6, approximately 0.29 acres, to PDR zoning and approving a general development plan for 30 single-family detached residential units. All right, staff, I mean applicant, who do we have? Oh, Mr. Rudisell, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Commission. Uh, for the record, I'm Scott Rudisill. I'm here on behalf of the applicant, and I have been sworn. Uh, this is our project team. They're all here today to answer any questions that you may have, although I will handle the, the bulk of the, the presentation. 
All right, this is a location map uh, for the project. The site is approximately 9.1 acres located on the south side of Experimental Farm Road, uh, just east of 16th Avenue East. And this is a, a closer look at the site. This is your uh, zoning map for the area. Uh, as was mentioned, the site is a combination of RSF 2 and RSF 6. And then similarly on the future land use map here, the site is a combination of Res 6 and Res 3. And this is a map showing the development trends in the area. You can see um, there are several residential projects and um, some Euclidean uh, single family residentially zoned areas surrounding the site. And here's our proposed GDP. Uh, it is a maximum of 30 single family detached lots at a density of 3.3 dwelling units the acre, which is right in line uh, with how this area is planned to develop. Uh, there's a three acre wetland located in the middle of the site, which must be impacted, um, but it is low quality and will be mitigated. Uh, the project is meeting all the buffering requirements of the code. 20-foot roadway buffer, 15-foot perimeter buffer, um, and in addition, the applicant is also providing um, opaque fencing around the perimeter of the project. And this is a concept plan to show what we think this will look like with lots. I'm sure the chairman will remind you that it is not binding, uh, but it is here to, Thank you, <laughs> just here to give you an idea of what we think the project will look like. Also, um, there is a Specific approval request, uh, the same one that you heard earlier this morning for a um, reduced secondary front yard setback from 25 feet to 10, um, which, which has become fairly common. Um, so that concludes our presentation. Uh, we're respectfully requesting your recommendation of approval and happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Lucille. Any questions for the applicant at this point? Mr. Rutledge. Yeah, can you, you said how, how much of the property is actually wetlands? I'm looking at the survey that's provided. It looks like the entire property is wetlands of some quality. Not, I'm not asking about quality yet, just acreage. It's it's three acres, so it's it's about a third of the site is wetland. Um, this was an old palm nursery, so it, it is an impacted wetland. It has invasives. Uh, it is low quality. It is isolated. So um, we haven't. There hasn't been much pushback on the on the impacts. And, and so no mitigations required? There will be mitigation required. We, don't, we just don't know at this point yet what that will be. Okay, but your expectation is when you take that many acres, no matter the quality, that you'll have to mitigate some of that and you're pres preserving some of it, right? It, it will likely be an off-site mitigation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Mitigation bank, or you don't have any idea yet? I don't think we know yet. Okay. Dale might know. Uh, Dale Merriman is our... If it's important, he can come up and answer that. All right. Any questions for the applicant at this point? Okay. Staff presentation. Good morning, Planning Commission. For the record, James McDevitt with Manatee County Planning. I have been sworn. So Scott Russell did a great job of presenting the project. I'm going to go more over the wetland portion as that has an impact on their density calculation for this application. As he's mentioned, it is split between the Res 3 and the Res 6 future land use categories. There is approximately 2.9 acres in the Res 6, approximately 6.2 in the Res 3. The zoning has already been discussed, but their request is rezoned to a planned development residential with 30 single family residential single family units. This is what's been submitted with the application. Can you go back one slide? Yes, sir. RSF2 is eight acres, and the six is only a quarter of an acre? As it exists today, yes. All right, thank you. And he did mention that the buffers and setbacks are all being required as, as required, provided as required. Uh, they did provide a PVC fence that they're going to have on the north, south, east, and west, eight feet on the, north, on the east, west, and south, and six feet on the north side. They're also providing a public flowage easement along the east and south and a public access maintenance easement on those same sides. 
So this is the existing conditions sheet from their general development plan. It shows that the wetland is approximately 3.08 acres, roughly in the center of the property. So the comprehensive plan has a policy in place where it limits the development transfer rights for wetlands that exceed 20% of the project acreage. And I know since that's a lot of words up there, I tried to bring out the ones that were pertinent to this particular request. So it's permitting the transfer of density limited to wetland acreage less than or equal to 20% of the total gross project acreage. Although it's further subjected to limitations on gross and net density as established in the land use category and in the compliance with other applicable land development code regulations. In the land development code, this is the implementing zone uh, section for that. And again, that's a lot of words, so I've pulled out the words that are relevant to this request. The acreage within a wetland and wetland buffer may be used to determine the total allowable units in conformity with the requirements of the comprehensive plan. That limitation of credit is to any alteration or relocation of jurisdictional wetland shall be minimized by limiting the density credit to 50% of the maximum density in addition to any reduction caused by the wetland acreage exceeding 20%. Now that sounds kind of complicated, so what I've done is break it down into a calculation to show you the step-by-step -step how we get to our number. So this is a, an illustration again of the future land use categories, and again, we're showing the gross acreages for each of them, but I've also provided the wetland acreages, approximately 0.5 wetlands, uh, acres of wetlands in the Res 6, approximately 2.58 acres in the Res 3. So this is showing whether or not a wetland development transfer credit needs to take place per future land use category. The gross acreage for res three is 6.2. The wetland acreage is 2.58. That equates to approximately 41.6%. So a transfer is required. The res six is 2.9% of the gross acreage. Approximately 0.5 acres of that are wetland. That equates to approximately 17.2%. That does not exceed 20%. So 1706.9 from the LDC does not have to be implemented here. So this is where everybody said, when am I going to use that again when I grow up? This is that time. This is the gross acreage minus the wetland acreage to give you the upland acreage for the res 3. Again, this is only for the res 3 portion of the project. We take that upland acreage and add 10% back to it, 10% from the total project acreage. That's only 10% because they are impacting wetlands. If they were to not impact it, it would be 20%. And when we add those two numbers together, we get our calculable acreage of 4.24 acres. We then multiply that by the future land use category density, which is three, and we get 12.72 dwelling units. Your middle school math teacher would be proud. <laughs> Thank you. That would have been my high school teacher. But that's exactly, because I forgot it by ninth grade, so. So we're back to this table here, and we're showing that the res three was that 12.72. We do the standard multiplication of 2.9 acres times six dwelling units per acre, and we get 17.4. And that gives us a grand total of 30.12. And since we can't have 0.12 of a dwelling, it's 30 dwelling units maximum for this project. And that's what they're proposing today. There is one specific approval request, and it's again that same one as mentioned before. A second front is treated as a side with a 10 foot setback as opposed to 25. So positive and negative, negative aspects, we have sanitary and sewer and potable water available at this site, uh, and the Res 3 and the Res 6 future land use categories anticipate this type of residential development. The negative aspect is really that their in intent is to impact 100% of the wetlands. Uh, their mitigating measures are that that development transfer credit has limited their development rights for the site. The applicant must identify the focal point of development at time of final site plan, compliant with 4027D4. And they are going to provide the adequate buffering setbacks and separation from uses in adjacent and surrounding sites. So it is with the proposed stipulation specific approval, it is the opinion of staff that the request for a rezone to a GDP is consistent with the applicable comprehensive plan goals, objectives, and policies, as well as all applicable regulations of the LDC. And I'm available if you have any questions. Thank you. Any questions for staff? Mr. Rutledge. Since I didn't graduate math, uh, if 
Can you tell me how many acres of wetlands currently exist on these on the submitted property, and how much uh, replacement wetlands they'll have to per <laughs> Sorry, can you tell me the uh, multiple of wetlands of high quality that we'll get if they impact these X number of acres of poor wetlands? We have Kara with the plan planning section, environmental planning. Step forward, please. <laughs> Good morning, Kara Koenig for staff, and I have been sworn. So this will be a, a wetland that has to be mitigated through the state. It is not a non-viable due to the acreage. So what will happen is that they'll take the functional score of that wetland and base it off the functional loss. They'll have to mitigate, and it'll likely be through a mitigation bank. Okay. And what's the calculation for the wetlands? I know that when we did uh, 70 and 75, we gave up 140 acres for 40. And so I'm just, what's the replacement to the community in wetlands for what we're giving up? So for mitigation through the county, we do have ratios, okay. but that's not how it's done through the state. It's, it's the uniform mitigation assessment method. So they, they identify qualities of, you know, habitat, hydrology, wildlife, suitability, et cetera, and then calculate this overall score, which determines the functional loss. It's not based on acreage through swift mud. So we don't know what we're getting. We don't. And it, and it won't be the county that the mitigation is through. It's through the state. So they'll have to go through the environmental resource permit process. Mm -hmm. And they'll come up with a UMAM number and they'll say 0. Yeah. 0. 0.42, 0. 0.86, 0. 0.97, exactly. whatever it is, or 1.3. And then the applicant will have to either buy credits or build something or do something. So we, yeah. we don't So they'll know. likely purchase mitigation bank credits. But as they alluded to, it is it previously was a palm nursery. There previously were palms planted in the wetland, and it's full, 95% full of category one and two nuisance exotics. Oh, it so is. it's basically okay. a lot of Brazilian pepper. It's classified as an exotic hardwood wetland. Okay, all so, right, helpful, thank you. Um, the applicant mentioned that it's an isolated wetland. There's an outfall, at least I, I see to the south, but that does not connect. So. Will you need a core permit or will they not need a core permit? Not that it really matters. I'm just curious. I would defer to their environmental consultant on that. And you can do that at rebuttal. Okay. Anything else for staff at this point? Chairman. Ms. Prosser. Um, could you explain? I, I thought I heard, is there PVC fencing around the property? Is there any landscape buffering? They are providing the required buffers, and they also are providing the PVC fence on the inner edge of the of that buffer. Okay, thank you. Anything else for staff? All right, thank you. Oh, Ms. Keba, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm, I'm just just a thought out there in in general, not related necessarily to this, but the whole side yard, front yard thing. I mean, have staff considered proposing that as a change to the code instead of it always being? I don't think we've ever voted against it. And just is it time to consider a code change rather than? being an exception or I'll let Rachel handle that since that's her department but that would imply we've been wrong for all these de <laughs> all these decades I mean <laughs> just <laughs> what changed <laughs> I think I've seen it 10 15 times so. yeah. <laughs> Commissioner I agree I think it is something we may need to take a look at but I'm just as surprised as chair Bedford um, that we've changed it in the last year and a half to be a 10 foot side yard or 10 foot setback for a secondary side. Um, I would imagine that the circumstances of the implementation are very limited, but we can take a look at that amongst staff and come back with something. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And Rachel, would we want to keep in place something that is two fronts? We have a lot of existing lots that aren't coming through in, an, in a new subdivision that are just lots out there that they have to have. Yeah. The same requirement of two fronts a and a larger setback, yeah. Well, just historically, it's always been the two fronts and two sides, just so that those corners have a little more breathing space and you're not jammed right up to the side. And I think that's, relatively speaking, good planning. Um, I'm not going to vote against it now, although, I, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. I've always had two sides and two fronts. So I, I don't know. And I might argue that it's better to have them come and explain why they need it as opposed to generally give it as a free, because... Every time you give something away, it You'll gets further it down the road, yeah. So, um, but, but I understand the thinking. If we have to make the exception, I'd like to know why. Okay. If this is good planning, and I'll take his advice. 
Did you mention Euclidean zoning, or was that the previous one? You mentioned Euclidean zoning. There's no Euclidean zoning with this. It was a but great word. That's actually from Cleveland, Euclid. Euclid Street and all that stuff in 1929, I think it was. But Sorry. All right, nothing else for staff. We'll open the public comment portion of this. Is there anyone in the public that would like to come forward and speak? Come on down. <coughs> State your name, whether or not you've been sworn in your county of residence, and if there's anyone else that wants to come down, you can... Toddle on down as well. You're right behind me. <laughs> Hi, my name is Susan Hill. I'm a Manatee County resident, and I have been sworn. Um, my property, I don't have. I have visuals, but they're the old-fashioned kind, the ones they send you in the mail. That can help bring Our up property up. is located. Could you we move the microphone down? I don't think you're being picked up. There okay. Can you hear me now? <laughs> oh. Okay. Our our property is located due to the east of this development. It when we bought the property in in 1995, the whole area was agricultural. We bought farmland. The road's called Experimental Farm Road. We kind of intended it to be that way. We know progress continues. I've lived in Manatee County my whole life, so I remember when they built Westgate Shopping Center. <laughs> um, my, my concerns, and I want to submit a letter so it goes on record, is there's a drainage ditch that runs <clears throat> on the side of our property, but it, actually the property drains from the east through my front yard. So when we built, we had to put a culvert in our front yard. Well, when that drainage ditch gets full and it runs behind the property that they're developing, it goes over to Canal Road, hence Canal Road. During rainstorms, I've got pictures to show my front yard. If that drainage is interrupted, I'm going to flood. Um, the traffic on 49th Street is also atrocious. It takes five minutes to get out of the out of my driveway, and I can face can, or, or 49th Street. Um, the houses, 30 houses on less than eight acres. Most of the acreage there, the house, the acres behind me, they have. Eight acres, it's one house. There, beside me, there's seven acres, there's two houses. It seems like a little much. I know that progress goes, but uh, I can't imagine the noise. I can't imagine the traffic. Um, I'm concerned with the ditch and not having a buffer between my property. We've had horses in the past. They have jumped the ditch and got over there. So. That, that's a possibility. I don't know if we don't have them at this moment, but we're still zoned to have horses. So I just want to go on record saying that I object to this, and thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, ma'am. Mr. Any Chairman. To add, honey? Uh, Ms. Okay. Can uh, I submit these pictures about my front yard well, it, you, you with certainly a letter? Can, it, you certainly can, but if, if you set them down, then we have to keep them. Okay. We will have them available at the county commission meeting. You certainly okay. can show us. Absolutely. You, okay. Um, and but I'm but it looks like grass with a lot of water in it, right? Pardon me. It said it looks like grass with a lot of water in it. Yeah, it looks like a lot of water. We've had a couple. Of, we've been there through a couple of hurricanes, and actually, the house has looked like an island at one time yep. because the water flows through there to the ditch and then over to Canal Road. We will have, um, as part of staff closing comments, we'll have someone from staff talk about stormwater requirements. So we'll have some some closure on that. The applicant will probably okay. touch on that as well. Actually, Ms. Greer, a, oh, I'm, go, hold, hold on, hold on. She, I did not see where your property was because you were pointing on the screen, but I don't see that. You need to point down on the document. Okay, so you're dire directly to the east of the site? Yes, we yeah. are. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to understand. All right. I, if I, the I like hold, up, hold on. Okay. If the gentleman would like to speak, you need to tell us your name, whether or not you've been sworn in your county of residence. I, I've been sworn, and this is part of my property, too. I'm Jim Hill. Okay. Okay. There you go. Does, does it, we own this. Okay, and um, speak up to the what microphone. What my wife was so. trying to tell you about the strainage is 
We have a 15 inch culvert running in front of our front yard, <coughs> which moves us. You need to speak to into the microphone or it's not going to get We have a 15 inch culvert <laughs> running all the way through our front yard that moves this water from the east over to the west. Okay, well, when that culvert can't take the water flow from our neighbors on uh, the east side, it flows over our property. And that's what we're showing in these pictures. Okay. So okay. it's coming from the east through your property headed west. Right, to okay. the west. All right. And, and, and in the past, when that ditch got full, it went in that wetland. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it truly is a wetland. Okay. And that's all I got to say. All right. I hope you consider, you know, not doing this, but I know you probably <coughs> won't. But there are, we're, we're doing the best we can. Absolutely. Thank you. There are Thank you. staff, and I'm sure applicant will talk about stormwater requirements as part of their closing comments. Is there anyone else in the public that would like to inform and speak for or against this item during public comment? Seeing no one come forward, we'll close public comment. Staff closing comments. I'm looking for core permit, flooding, traffic, and barrier is what I wrote down. Denise, can you speak to stormwater in that? Yes. Back? So if we want to hit stormwater first, they will have to um, if show if that wetland is holding water on site, they will have to mitigate that storage that's there. That'll be part of their analysis. Um, this is an area that they will have to determine the 100-year flood elevation and build to that. So um, they will also have to determine where their outfall is for the site and they will have to maintain that same location and not exceed whatever is flowing there in the existing condition. Um, I think it is good to note that if it is determined that the wetland does not have a pop-off and it is holding water, that, like I said, they will need to mitigate for that storage on that site. From the grading plan I'm seeing, it sure looks like that wetland drains to the south. Um, but um, hard to tell. As I'm looking at their plan, I'm seeing a 20-foot proposed public maintenance access easement along the east side on this property, but it also seems to coincide with the 15-foot greenbelt buffer. I'm not sure that one overlaps the other, but you can look at that detailed. So this drainage ditch that we're talking about, it goes between the east property and this property, kind of meanders. Do, does anyone know? Maybe the applicant knows. I'm looking at the grading, it's hard to tell. You, you, staff doesn't know, and appli well, applicant might get to it. Ms. Greer, any idea? Yeah, I think you need to have the applicant address that question. Uh, yep, all right. Um, traffic, oh, oh, go ahead. No, Ms. K I just want to say one thing, Kara Kane again for staff. So you are correct that the buffer and the drainage easement overlap, um, but there is an additional five feet, so really, to the east and to the south, there's 25 feet from the adjacent properties to where they would have, say, a structure. Okay. Um, so there's five feet of unobstructed space for them to plant the required plantings. Okay, thank you. Traffic. <clears throat> yes, sir. Um, this project uh, would generate uh, about 250 trips during PM peak hour. Um, Experimental road uh, has uh, a current traffic flow uh, about uh, 500 with uh, with uh, the reserve trips and current trips. Um, the capacity of the roadway is uh, about 1,300 trips during the PM peak hour. Um, it means the level of service of this road is C. Um, there are no impacts uh, on ter in terms of capacity. Uh, on the on the roadway. So 49th is what's it operating at or will be? It is uh, operating C and will be operating also C. C, okay. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, um, le let me let me be clear. The, this this project uh, will generate uh, um, with train with 30 dwelling units. We generate only 32 trips during the PM peak hour. It means one trip every 30 seconds. 
All right. Any questions? Buffer to the east and to the west. Um, probably better for the applicant to respond to that, I think. So we can talk about that in a second. Anything, Ms. Greer? And I was going to say, if, if when they do speak to it, if they could show the GDP that shows the um, topo, there, like you said, there is a connection, a 15-inch pipe that connects the wetland to the ditch to the south. So if they've done any analysis on that, maybe they could share that. Yeah, it says here, proposed drainage outfall location. So it's on the plan. All right, anything else for staff at this point? All right, applicant closing comments? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, uh, Scott Rudisill for the applicant. Um, let's see, I think I'll probably start. We'll start with your Army Corps question, and we'll bring... We'll bring Dale Merriman, who's our environmental consultant, up to talk about that, and then we'll we'll work our way through the others uh, with the rest of our team. Good morning, uh, Dale with Merriman Environmental, and I have been sworn. As far as the uh, Corps of Engineers goes, um, it is an isolated wetland. Uh, there are perimeter ditches around the property, and the one that you spoke of. Uh, is is like a little swale where when the wetland would fill up, it would just overflow. But uh, normally, the, in this case, DEP, which is acting as the Corps of Engineers, uh, would not claim this particular property. We would go to them and get a, a letter of no permit required, so they will have um, you know eyes on the site and be able to make a determination. But at this point in time, no, sir. It wouldn't be the core. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. And we do have Michael Yates here. If there are any further questions on traffic beyond what... Uh, I'm, I'm comfortable. Staff says C will continue to be a C, so unless they have something to offer to that, Mr. Okay. Yates is shaking his head no. So, okay. Although and if anyone else has a question, Mr. Yates is in the back for transportation if we need to ask. Mr. Rudis, I'm sorry. Um, on the... On the drainage, uh, there's a 20-foot public drainage flowage access easement that is proposed along the eastern boundary and along the southern boundary. The, there is a 15-foot buffer that will be within that same area. Um, so, yes, th those do overlap. Let uh, me ask a do. question about that. Who's responsible for maintaining and cleaning out that public easement for drainage? That The county would be responsible for... Um, maintaining it to the to the point that it would flow, but in terms of anything beyond that, that would be on the applicant. Is that Ms. Greer? Yes. Yeah, so what we do is we get a flowage easement. We'll go in and clean it out if a tree falls, something like that. It's an emergency situation. Just the day to day cleaning of it, or if they need it, want it to be beautified, that's on the applicant. Right. Okay. And we will double check. Um, if this is a county maintained ditch right now, we do have some in the county. Many of our ditches are not county maintained at the moment, but we will double check that. Mr. Routledge. Yes, uh, and then would that include a, an agreement for their maintenance obligations or an easement right to expose us to the access but not the obligation to maintain it? Correct. We would need to be able to access it in some way. Uh, buffers, um, a little clearer, I think, on east, west, and south fence, fence dimensions, opacity, anything you can offer? Yes, so it's uh, it's a 15-foot uh, perimeter buffer on the east, west, and south, 20-foot roadway buffer on the north, and it is a 6-foot uh, PVC vinyl fence that's being provided on the project side of, of the buffer. Okay. And you're allowing, I believe you have future right away off of uh, 49th. You're allowing for some future right away. Yes, that's County's correct. happy with that. Yep. Okay. All right. Any other questions for the applicant and or staff? Right. Chair will entertain a motion. if I'm in the game or not. We have 
We have a motion and we have a second. We have a motion to approve and a second. We may now vote. Motion carries unanimously for approval. We will take a 10 minute break here. So we're going to take a short 10 minute break before because the poor clerk of the circuit court has to sit there. So perfect time. Yep. <laughs> Starting to get cold.
can't see the wall back there. Could we come back to order, please? Ms. Greer. I will. Good morning. If we can come back to order, please. Great equipment. If we can come back to order, please. We've been yelled at um, numerously this morning about we can't hear. So if staff could speak into their microphones, if all of us planning commissioners could speak into your microphones. And yay, see, do this. But to be fair, the public, you need to speak into your microphone as well. We'll try. We're professionals. We should be able to do it. We'll work with you. So anyway, <laughs> we now have, um, if we come back to order, we now have item number seven. Ms. Greer, would you please read this into the record? ZL 2328, Jones 301 Parish Rezone, Jones Potato Farm, Inc., Alan E. Jones is the owner. It's quasi-judicial. We've got Rosina Leiter here for staff, and it's a rezone of approximately 4.68 acres from A1 PCV to VIL Village L PCV. And it's the east portion of a 16.69-acre parcel um, located along US 301. Has uh, any planning commissioners had any ex parte communications on this item? No, sir. No, thank you. Applicant, good morning, Ms. Tusing. Good morning. Margaret Tusing with CNS Engineering, and I have not been sworn. Is there anyone in this public is even remotely planning, thinking, might get moved to talk in, in joy, anger, or whatever? Please stand up and get sworn in at this point. Any, hold on, they're thinking. They're, they're, I might talk. I'm going to get mad. There, see? There we go. No, no, they're all <laughs> That's Start it. Again, right? There you go. It doesn't hurt. There's no cost. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tusing. Continue. I thought it was only going to be me, so that was nice to see more people standing up. I'm Mar As I said, I'm Margaret Teasing with ZNS Engineering. I'm here representing Jones Potato Farm for a standard rezone that is limited. And as Ms. Greer said, it is a 4.68 rezone of a 10.69 site. Oh, how do I do this? As I said, the applicant is Jones Potato Farm, and this is the property location. As you can see, the outlined in yellow is the property that Mr. Jones owns and the hashed mark is the subject rezone portion. The property is located north of County Road 675, south of State Road 62, and east of US 301. The rezone is the justification for these items. The parcel is under single ownership and has been for a number of years. And with this rezone, it will make the zoning on the entire site the same. As you can see, there is village zoning to the north that extends back to the same distance that we are asking for. And then the, the blue stripe is the parish commercial village overlay district. So the entire site is within that. And then because this is a limited zoning, we worked with staff and we did proffer a schedule of permitted and prohibited uses, even though it is a standard rezone. It's consistent with the comprehensive plan and the land development code. As you know, the village zoning is, has site-specific items that you must meet, as well as a com commercial overlay. So I think that if you have any questions, I think this is consistent, and we respectfully ask for your approval. Thank you, Ms. Tusing. Any questions for the applicant at this point? Staff presentation. I got stuck. 
Where is the... Remember to talk in the microphone like oh. I'm doing, see? Right? People in the back, is it good now? There you go, I'm getting thumbs up. There. Good morning, Rosina Leider by staff, and I have been sworn. Um, I'm going to point at some additional information uh, from the presentation. Uh, let's see. Like uh, the applicant stated, that is the site is part of a large parcel and is 4.68 acres to be rezoned and is within the parish commercial villas overlay. And this reason allowed that the site, that the parcel going to be on the only one zoning district, and this is the location. The site is uh, east of um, US 201, and is uh, considered within an activity node because it's uh, 1,000 feet from uh, County Road 675, and meet the, dis the distance to from State Road 62. That means it is within two activity nodes and has two future land use categories. The portion that is already Sun Village is with, uh, the, within the Res 6, and the portion that is uh, subject to be rezoned is within the UF3. Given that, uh, the maximum potential for um, entitlements for uh, Florida ratio with UF3 is 0 0.50 with activity nodes. However, the land development code restricts to 0 0.23 floor area ratio for properties within the village. And the maximum square footage that could be built in this portion of the site is more or less 46,000 square feet. And also, they have potential for 14 residential units and 42 if is an affordable housing or an activity node. That means that the maximum that they can build is 42. With the Florida ratio, it's important to mark that the parish commercial village restrict the square footage to 20,000 square feet. If you have more than <coughs> 20,000 square feet, you have to go to a special permit. A staff is comfortable with the uses that has been uh, removed from the schedule of uses because remove all the intensive uses that are allowed within the village and is um, removing the intensives or um, we will require to be a special permit. Um, what else? I don't think so. There is anything that is important. We are comfortable with the schedule uses and the den the density is like I started, and the, they need to go to a special permit if it's more than twenty thousand square feet of building. I don't know if you have any a specific question. Thank you. Any questions for staff at this point? No. Okay. We will now open the portion of the public hearing to the. Pu I mean, uh, we will open. Sorry, and let me add something. The commercial Paris Village has uh, um, stricted regulations that has to be met at time of financing plan. More than, uh, it's an overlay with a, a lot of restrictions related to the location of the buildings, the sick bags and the high and the potential uses and everything. That's the Parish Overlay District? Yes. Okay. All right, any questions for staff? All right, we'll open the public comment portion of this hearing. Is there anyone in the public that would like to come forward and speak for or against this item? Anyone in the public? I was hoping you were all gonna come and then, but no, it's the next one you're here for. Okay. Is there anyone in the public that wants to come forward and speak for or against this item? Anyone? We'll close the public comment portion. Staff closing comments? None. I'm sorry. A applicant closing comments? None. Any questions? Chair will entertain a motion. <coughs> we have a motion. We have a motion and a second. You may vote now. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously to pass. Thank you. Item number eight and nine. We have a couple of Paperwork things. First of all, um, one of our commissioners has a potential conflict of interest, so she will be recusing herself at this point. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Um, Chair, I just want to say that upon legal advice, um, Mark has been advised to have a, to abstain from voting on numbers eight, the Compton Amendment, and nine, the Shops Harrison Ranch. Okay. Thank you. 
we will we will probably also um, <coughs> miss, like, you'll probably want to open these both at the same time Correct. for discussion Correct. all right so what we're going to do we're going to open open both in eight and nine at the same time since they're interconnected we'll have presentations on both of them but the discussion will be for both together and then at the end we will vote on them separately so we're going to open both eight and nine at this time Ms. Greer would you please read them into the record yes and you did just receive um, some public comment that just came in today Item number eight, PA 2311, Ordinance 2411, Shops at Harrison Ranch. It's a small-scale comprehensive plan map amendment. Uh, Dan Greenberg is here for staff. And then number nine is a PDMU 1112 GR2, Shops at Harrison Ranch, HC Properties, LLC is the owner, and Laura Gonzalez is here for staff on that one. Um, and that's amending the ordinance and general development plan to allow the multi-use up to 320 units and a freestanding emergency department and retaining the 300,000 square feet of non-residential uses previously approved, establish of a land use equivalency matrix and approving a revised schedule of permitted and prohibited uses. Thank you. Have any planning commissioners had any ex parte communications on this item? No, sir. No. Okay. We have the applicant then. Good morning again, Mr. Rudisill. Morning, commissioners. For the record, I'm Scott Rudisill, I'm attorney at Blaylock Walters. I'm here on behalf of the applicant, HC Properties. Okay. Oh, there we go. All right. Uh, this is our consultant team that uh, that is here today. We have Jeb Mulock as our, our civil engineer with ZNS, Margaret Tusin and Paige Estegriba, our planners with ZNS. Uh, Chris Kennedy uh, is going to be our environmental consultant with Kimley Horn, and then we have Steve Henry here for traffic. All right, there are two requests before you today. Uh, the first is a future land use map amendment uh, from the Res 3 category and the UF 3 category to ROR uh, with some D5 limitations, which we'll talk about. Um, and the second request is to amend the, uh, the existing approved GDP for the shops at Harrison Ranch project. And we're going to start with the, with the comprehensive plan amendment. And I think what probably makes the most sense is to kind of give an overview of what we're asking for um, I think it's relatively simple, and then I'll get into kind of the details of the request. But in essence, you have a project, and you can see the location on the aerial. This project site is currently approved for 300,000 square feet of commercial uses. What the applicant is asking for with these two requests is for the potential to convert some of those existing commercial entitlements into either multifamily uses up to uh, 320 units potentially um, or a freestanding emergency department. So those are the two proposed uses that are being requested to be added. Um, they're both being requested pursuant to a land use equivalency matrix, so it would be via exchange of those commercial entitlements. That's the, that's the gist of the request, but um, now we'll get into some of the details here. So this is the location. Uh, it's about 30 acres located at the northeast and northwest corners of US 301 and Harrison Ranch Boulevard. Uh, this is your future land use map for the area. Um, you can see the, uh, the site is a mix of the Res 3 and UF 3. And then you can see that there are freestanding ROR locations both to the east and to the west of the site. That occurs in a number of locations along US 301. Um, usually it's intended to hit those mid-block areas where you're not at a node and you want to be able to do either commercial or if you're looking to do a um, multifamily project. And so that's what those, when you see those ROR locations that are, that are out there in the middle of nowhere, that's what they generally are. Um, this site actually is at a node um, it's just in an area that was not planned as a node at the time that the comprehensive plan was adopted. And so that's why you see the, 
the Res 3 and the, and the UF 3 is how this area was planned. This site now is the major intersection between uh, an arterial roadway and a collector in Harrison Ranch Boulevard. And so we think ROR is appropriate in that location. Um, let's see, moving on here. This kind of gets into some of the things that I was talking about previously. Um, we, the ROR is requested on this site mainly because of the proposed freestanding emergency department. That is only allowed in the ROR category or the mixed use category. And so we've requested ROR here. Um, we are not seeking to utilize the, the maximum densities available under the ROR, so we, we wouldn't need the ROR category for the mixed use, I guess, or for the multifamily is, is what I'm getting at. Um, and so we have limited the potential density here to a maximum of 320 units across the entire site. And so now I'm going to move on to the revisions to the GDP that are similar to what we've already talked about. Uh, this is the existing zoning. You can see it's PDMU. Um, that is what is already existing on the site, so we're not seeking a rezone today. And this is an overview of the uh, proposed revisions that we talked about. Um, again, the site is already entitled for 300,000 square feet of commercial uses. Applicant is requesting to add that land use equivalency matrix that allows for that conversion of commercial to either multifamily and or the freestanding emergency department. Um, we are removing the old references to the NCO and we are asking, um, there is some proposed upland preservation on the site. We're asking for the potential to um, provide for um, at least a portion of that offsite and staff is supportive of that request. And that's the general development plan. Uh, there is one specific approval request on the project, um, and that is the freestanding emergency department. When that was put into the code, it requires a uh, board approved preliminary site plan. So in this case, we have an existing general development plan. And so in order for us to comply with that requirement, we would have to do a separate preliminary site plan for just that FSED portion of the site and bring that to the board. We didn't think that made a lot of sense. And if you can see at the northeast corner of the intersection there, that's the area that is labeled for the potential FSED site. That's what the little boxes with the arrows shooting out from it. Um, that's the uh, potential location of the FSED site. And so as you can see, we've located it such that it is a significant distance from any potential impacts to the residential uses. And so that's why we think it is appropriate to approve the FSED with the uh, general development plan as opposed to trying to come back with a preliminary site plan here. The FSED will meet all the other requirements under uh, the specific section in 531.62. And with that, uh, we're requesting your recommendation of approval and happy to answer any questions. Uh, any questions for staff, at this, I mean, the applicant at this point? Yes. Uh, Mr. Rutledge. So we don't know whether your intent is to make it residential or commercial, so you're asking for both choices and a ma matrix to mix them up, <clears throat> correct? Essentially, yes. I mean, it's, it's already approved for commercial. We're asking to add a residential option. And have you shown the matrix that you propose, or is it you're using a standard that we have? We do have. There is a, a matrix in the we – can, we can pull that up, and mm -hmm. we can show you what that, what that conversion looks like, if that's what you mean. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. okay. That's all. Thanks. I just, and, and what is a uh, – yes, Ms. Kaba. I'm sorry. Um, can you just explain what a freestanding emergency facility is exactly, as opposed to urgent care or a hospital or – It's basically the emergency room without the rest of the hospital is, is essentially what it is. So you would have emergency room um, with 
uh, ambulances coming to the site and things like that, um, but without the rest of the hospital component. So there's no overnight beds or like a hospital would have? That's or, right. Okay, just dealing with emergencies, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you, in addition to that, is there a special permit from the hospital required for those, or is this just a... My bad, sorry. Uh, is this require a special permit of some kind uh, for that particular use? It, it doesn't require a special permit. There are uh, specific use criteria under the code for a freestanding emergency department, and, and we are meeting all of those requirements. I wanted to indicate the, the reason it's called that kind of unusual name is the Florida statutes. Well, that's what I it, yeah, no we had as definitions of a lawsuit that we were calling it like existing use without defining it. And the court said, no, you have to amend your code and define it. So freestanding emergency room department comes right out of the Florida statutes. And now they're calling it hospital-based off-campus emergency department. <laughs> and yet all sorts of signage up saying it's not an urgent care center. So the statutes just acknowledge it's part of the hospital, but it's off campus. Right, and I understood that the hospitals had a distance <coughs> requirement, a, a use demand that they had to facilitate or, or say they're addressing to get the right to move to them. You, I, I don't know, but I know it's a lot of statute regulates that. Okay, I believe Mr. Rutledge is ACA stuff. Mm -hmm. ACA standards, yeah. you have to yeah. verify the number of beds and all that yes, stuff. Yes, right. Yeah, and I think that's all state regulated, not... But, but, but is that what you're asking for? No, we're not, we're not asking right. for that. Uh, my understanding is that th what previously hospitals were required to obtain a certificate of need from the state, and that has gone away, and so that has opened the door up. That's why you're seeing more of these, not only more hospitals, but more of these freestanding emergency rooms and things like that. Okay. Anything else for the applicant at this point? All right, staff presentation. Remember to speak into the microphone, or there'll be spit wads in the back of your head. Yeah, yeah. At least I've had my coffee this okay, time. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Dan Greenberg for the record. Um, the applicant, again, has provided significant information, so I'll try and be brief. Um, happy to answer any questions if you want to interrupt. So the subject property is located approximately three and a half miles uh, east of I-75 off of US 301 at the intersection between Harrison Ranch Boulevard and... Uh, US 301. Jumping into the future land use classifications, uh, the applicant's requesting to amend the future land use classic classification, excuse me, from existing Res 3 and urban fringe uh, to the proposed retail uh, office residential ROR. Um, in addition to that, they're proposing a text amendment, which we'll, we'll go into, and the applicant has, a, has a spoken to briefly. Um, comparing the existing proposed, existing future land use classifications, excuse me, to the proposed, we can see that ultimately, uh, currently, up to 90, 90 dwelling units could be possible. And I think um, I want to just stand here for a second on the point that we're seeking to, um, outside of their existing entitlements, simply to the future land use map classification of these existing categories, not speaking to your current entitlements or anything like that. So the numbers may be a little confusing, but that's, that's where they're coming from. Um, so currently they could do up to 90 units potentially under the existing future land use classifications. However, they could potentially get up to a density bonus uh, due to the activity node location and potentially ad awarded additional density with a mixed use project that would allow them up to 183 units on site. Um, the current future land use classifications are limited to 0.5 in the urban fringe and 0.35 in the res 3. Um, that would increase, the, the floor area ratio would increase to 0.5 under the ROR. However, if they do mixed use development, they could get up to 1.0. Um, they are not proposing to limit that. That allows them a little flexibility. However, they have spoken to their D5 provisions, which do limit the maximum density for the entitled, um, for the, excuse me, the entire 30 point. Uh, one four acres to a maximum of 320 units as well as commercial development to 300,000 square feet um, in combination with their proposed uh, land use equivalency matrix. Looking to nearby projects we can see it's mostly uh, residential around there there are some intermittent commercial um, as uh, Mr. Rudis alluded to down the corridor. 
Uh, speaking to compatibility, it's primarily Res 3 and UF 3 surrounding. Um, again, they mentioned they are at the activity node, and you can see the, uh, the existing future land use classification would be changed to incorporate this parcel that it's, uh, excuse me, these two parcels that are uh, adjacent to the activity <laughs> node. Speaking to the positive aspects, um, it's in, it would be considered infill. Development of the site is west of the FDAB. Um, it's at an activity node we've spoken to. The, it's on uh, principal arterial as well as the urban collectors. Um, it could potentially allow for a mixed-use project and additional housing types. It's primarily single-family uh, residences out, over there and uh, in that area, and this would allow for different housing types, which could potentially help people. Uh, potential negative aspects are that the ROR, future land, land use classification, does allow for all residential. Um, it doesn't require the mixed use. Um, potentially could allow for significantly greater density than, the, than is surrounding. And with use of the land use equivalency matrix, um, we don't have a finalized number of exactly what would go, go forward there. We have more of a cap than to work underneath. So that's just a, a, a slight unknown. Um, however, there's a lot of mit mitigation factors, and um, they proposed the D5 amendment, which we refer to as a policy. Text policy would be implemented into the comprehensive plan, and that would restrict uh, density to 320, which puts it more in line with the surrounding area, and um, the 300,000 square foot potential maximum intensity, which we spoke to. Um, it's important to, to note in comprehensive plan policy 2.6.1.1 um, that potential um, incompatible characteristics of the of, of any proposed uses on site shall be required to mitigate, and there's a list of different techniques here. Um, so in summary, staff, uh, staff believes that the request is uh, in compliant with the applicable policies of the comp plan, the land development code, and uh, we are at this time requesting the planning board to provide a recommendation to the Board of County Commissioners so they can make a decision. Um, thank you. Staff is happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you. Any questions for staff at this point? Mr. Rutledge. Um, just can you put uh, back on your slide the mitigation, uh, such techniques for mitigation? Yes, thanks. And of those techniques, are they using all of those? That will be something to be discussed when they propose at the next level. And, and that's the challenge of right. the so future land use. You have to say yes, then you find out what's in the box, yes. and then you say, does the box, is that what we want, right? And, and that's the process. And, and again, it, it's challenging to promote development at a large scale if we have to solve all the problems at every stage, um, for lack of a better way to put it there. And just as a reminder, this does, this language does come right from the code, so there's no inferences there. It's code language. Okay, thank you. And you are... Um, we have a land use equivalency matrix. So the, the essence of that is it trades off traffic. There won't be any more. There's a fixed number of cars, probably assigned by 300,000 square feet of commercial, mm -hmm. which determines a number of trips. Mm -hmm. And then they trade them in between, so the number of trips relatively stays the same. Is that generally correct? Yes, thank you for speaking to that. I kind of okay. took the cliff notes, but that's it. All right, so whether you have you still have the same number of trips, it's just generated by different uses. Correct. Generally speaking. That's, that's the... Land use. That's yeah. the uh, methodology, excuse me. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Rowley. And one other question. So in regards to this particular uh, medical use with emergency <coughs> vehicles and so forth, do these mitigation components address that specifically as well? That is, these, uh, these components are to be discussed at the time we review that. So I'm not going to go into that because it's the next level, but yes is our answer, if that helps. Anything else for staff? I mean, the applicant at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Staff presentation. Good morning. Laura Gonzalez with Development Services Department, and I have been sworn. I agree with the applicant presentation, and I just want to, is there, okay. I just want to emphasize some aspects of the proposal. Uh, the primary changes introduced by this GDP amendment involve the inclusion of residential users and a freestanding emergency department to the commercial development approved in 2012, and the establishment of the land use equivalency matrix facilitating the exchange of existing commercial entitlements. Let's go to the GDP. 
Okay, this is the GDP. The West Parcel is proposed for commercial and multifamily residential uses. The East Parcel is designated for commercial uses, including uh, 100,000 square feet of a self-storage building that was approved and a free, uh, uh, emergency, uh, free standing emergency department. The currently uh, the current entitlements approved to this development total 300,000 square feet of commercial, including <coughs> the, the self-storage building, um, and the proposed additional uses uh, subject to exchange of commercial entitlements in accordance with the land use equivalency matrix are up to three, 320 multifamily units and the free stand, and up to 19,000 square feet for the freestanding emergency department. The use of the land use, land use equivalency matrix ensure that the number of streets associated with the new mix of uses does not exceed the approved number of trips for the development. If the multifamily use is developed on the West Parcel, potential compatibility issues could affect the single family uses adjacent to the development, especially those to the northeastern side of the West Parcel property line. To address these issues and provide separation from the multifamily buildings, the GDP proposed buffers, uh, you can see the scheme on the, on the screen, uh, and they are shown on the GDP too, with variable width depending on the, of the proposed use. In addition, along the northeast property line of the West Parcel, adjacent to the single family subdivision, a 15 foot wide screening buffer with a decorative wall is shown in the GDP and stipulated in the ordinance. Landscaping will be planted on the exterior side of the wall. The GDP also proposes minimum setbacks per use. In addition to, pro to the proposed buffer and setbacks, the commercial development on the east parcel is separated from the residential single family uses to the north with, some, with a stone water facility and a wetland preservation area. Also, the height is proposing uh, four stories subject to the building height compatibility section of the land development code that requires additional 20 foot setback over the minimum setback for each floor above three stories, as well as other design requirements to mitigate the impact of the height. The uh, applicant has requested specific approval to allow the proposed freestanding emergency department to be approved through the hearing process with the, development, the general development plan amendment instead of a preliminary site plan as required by code. <coughs> this request is consistent with the previous approvals of, for this development, a GDP that was approved in 2012 and amended in 2019. Uh, also, the process allowed for its review and approval by the board. And at time of the final site plan, the project will be reviewed for compliance with the requirements of the Section 531.62, which contains the design standard for the freestanding emergency department. The proposal meet the locational criteria contain, contains in this section. Uh, subject to the comprehensive plan amendment approval, the project will be located within the ROR future land use category and it is proposed adjacent to thoroughfares. With the proposed stipulations and related specific approval, and based on the analysis presented in the staff report, staff finds the request to be consistent with the policies of the comprehensive plan and the applicable requirements of the Land Development Code, subject to the comprehensive plan amendment that has been presented today. Compliance with the standards and requirements of the Land Development Code and comprehensive plan will be reviewed in detail at time of the preliminary site plan and final site plan submitted. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Is there any questions for staff at this point? Thank you. All right. We're going to open the public comment portion of this. If you have a plan of action, feel free to implement it now. 
Um, you have three minutes unless you have talked to the clerk ahead of time and provided necessary documentation. And the clerk says no one has. So please state your, this is for everyone, state your name that you've been sworn and your county residence. And you'll have three minutes. My name is Jackie Hepler. I have been sworn and I live in Manatee County. We recently learned of the proposed amendments at the plants of shops at Harrison Ranch with great distress. When we purchased our villa back in Normandy West in 2022, we were delighted with the view of our backyard sanctuary, which includes a small lake filled with aquatic birds, animals, nesting turtles, a view of an eagle's nest in the cell tower just beyond the pond. At the time of purchase, we were made aware that there might be some construction beyond our pond shops at Harrison Ranch. Beside having to endure the loud and messy disruption of the actual construction, we have these specific concerns. Safety issues, traffic congestion. It is already a dangerous situation at the corner of 301 and Harrison Ranch Boulevard. Adding a 320 apartment unit will only increase the odds of a tragic accident. So many questions have not been addressed. Has there been a traffic study? Are they going to install traffic lights? How will they be going in and out? Will they be using Harrison Ranch for Boulevard? A four-story, 320-unit apartment complex in a neighborhood of one-story homes destroys our skyline as well as the value of our homes. We learn that the parish fire department does not have a ladder truck to handle a four-story building, creating another safety concern. There are no other structures of four stories in our area. Why permit them here? Environmental issues. The endangered bald eagle's nest is in the cell tower near the construction area. They and other wildlife will be further endangered by the destruction of their habitats. Contaminants from construction runoff will go directly into our backyards and into the lake, which provides food source for the eagles and other wildlife. The construction noise alone will be harmful to their existence. According to a well-documented study, noise pollution from the construction is detrimental to our physical and mental well-being. There would be no place to escape given the proximity of our homes to the proposed construction site. Three, our community in Normandy West is comprised of mostly senior citizens. Retirees who have invested their life savings into a living into a quiet community. An apartment unit, along with an emergency room in front of our community, means increased hurried traffic, ambulance sirens at all hours of the day and night. We are under the understanding that two hospitals have been improved in Paris, one just being 2.7 miles away. Why would not an ER be placed on the site to provide comprehensive patient care? In closing, the commissioners are taxed with the well-beings of our citizens they represent. We implore you to consider the proposed plans to amend the shops at Harrison Ranch. We understand that the vacant land implies eventual development, but please consider the residents who live there that our lives are impacted before voting on this extreme plan. We are counting on the Commissioner Board to protect the current residents at Normandy East, West, and the entire Harrison Ranch. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next. No. no um, so listen. So um, other than the fact that that's inappropriate, this is a land use quasi-judicial event, and those kind of um, activities can cause the applicant to bring legal action against the county going forward. So please keep the uh, the yeas and all, just, let's just not do that. The, the other side doesn't go yay and nay, so let's just not do that. All Thank I you. I'm sorry? It's not what I said. I'm sorry? I'm not <laughs> Please state your name, your county residence, and whether or not you've been sworn. I'm Afra Wade, I live in Manatee County, and yes, I was sworn. I also live in Harrison Ranch in the Normandy West part. The parcels in question border our homes, villas in Normandy West and Normandy East. I'm asking for a vote of no for the rezoning. 
Even according to some of the paperwork from the Manatee County, there was an opinion from the staff that changing the FLUC to ROR is not complementary and supportive of the existing nearby area. The response by ZNS says it is resolved. My question is how? Also in the comments and points between Dan Greenberg and ZNS, there is a question. Why did the applicant have the pre-application review process waived? Unfortunately, that pre-application review process likely would have helped to generate comments and the potential for discussion related to the proposed FLUC change prior to the formal review process. We should have had a neighborhood meeting to ask questions and voice our concerns. This shows no respect for or care for the constituents and parish. In the section on urban sprawl, we do not need a freestanding ER because a hospital has been approved for parish, possibly two. How are the resources protected when asphalt is covering so much of the ground needed to keep natural systems in place? A clear separation needs to be in place between these two parcels and our homes. We have been an established neighborhood since 2007. Consideration for our safety, traffic congestion, <coughs> equity in our homes, and the environment, including wildlife. This application for rezoning has too many and ors and additions deletions. What is really the end game? When the storage facility is built, there will be five storage facilities within seven minutes to the Harrison Ranch and US 301 intersection, something else to consider. We respectfully request a no vote for the rezoning. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, Colleen Flaherty, Manatee County, and uh, just a couple, oh, and I have been sworn, um, just a couple comments. Um, I think we understood when we purchased in 2022 uh, how the property was zoned, and I guess the primary question is you're asking us to accept, um, or actually our developers are asking us to accept, kind of flipping that on its side. It's, it's saying, Here's what we agreed to. We have this piece of property, but you know what? We actually now want to do something else. And I think all of the homeowners in Normandy East and West, while I can't speak for them, I think you'd, you would sympathize with us that the sirens that we're going to hear from the emergency room, the only thing I could argue that would be the counterpoint would be if you approve a 320 unit building, we're going to need the darn hospital um, because <laughs> the amount of traffic and the disruption in that area it just really is wildly impractical. And I would also say the presentation that we're seeing from the developer feels very much like, it's very vague. Just trust me, we're gonna do this or that. It could be this and it might not be that. We're gonna ask you guys to, to really help us to take a stance to make it very definitive. We understood it was commercial. We even understand a need for residential. We just don't agree with four stories, 320 homes there. We just think that is really ludicrous. It's out of place in parish. Um, it doesn't exist and it poses a safety issue. So I would just say, consider the safety, consider where the families in those 320 apartments are going to play. This is a concrete jungle. There is no play area, right? This is going to be a parking lot and this is going to be 301, which we can argue in the future is going to need to be widened as well. So to me, it's just really ill placed. Um, it's very vague. And I would just encourage you to think long and hard if this was uh, in your backyard, how you would feel. And the pictures, while a lot of them show it, but if you look, this directly abuts Normandy West. I mean, this is, this is literally your backyard. You're going to see from a single family villa, you're gonna look and it's, it's right where you're standing. I mean, you're going to see a four story building. So I just ask you to think long and hard as you deliberate this decision and um, implore you to make the right decision for the community of Parrish and the residents of Normandy West. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nancy Alloy. Um, I am a resident of Manatee County, specifically in Normandy West at 4714 105th Avenue East Parish. And you have been sworn. I have been sworn, thank you. Um, I, I want to reiterate and support everything that the previous speakers have already commented on. Again, we, we also purchased in 2022 
and we're told about the proposed shops at Harrison Ranch. So we were anticipating something like the small strip malls that had um, maybe boutique shops, possibly a restaurant that we could en enjoy. Um, we were encouraged to think of it in terms of a mini Lakewood Ranch. What we weren't told is that the potential was there for a four-story building. We were told that that was not um, anything to be concerned about because of county planning laws and uh, restrictions. Um, we were told that there would be buffers if anything would be built, and if anything, it would maybe even decrease some of the noise from 301 that we currently experience. Instead, um, now we're being told that there's a vague plan that could be an either or, uh, or an and, of a four-story, 320-unit apartment building butting right up against our properties, completely diminishing our skyline. Um, we wouldn't see a sunrise anymore from, from that angle. Um, what the... and I'm, I think this is up here. What the uh, colorful maps of the applicants didn't show is the complete proximity to our homes, especially in Normandy West, uh, which is my community. Um, and if you look at the map here of where the uh, construction would be, this is actually my, my backyard right here, uh, the pond, and our neighbors are right along here. The proposals are right in this area. A 20-foot buffer to compensate for a four-story building, quite frankly, seems ridiculous. Um, I don't know how you compensate for that. The noise from a potential ER um, in our backyards is not going to uh, make anyone happy, as our previous people have said. And um, the, the traffic congestion from 320 family units, potentially a minimum of 400 cars in an intersection off of Harrison Ranch Boulevard into 301 is just impossible. I can't even imagine. We can't even make a right-hand turn safely sometimes, let alone a left trying to get out of the plan. Um, it's going to require additional roadways, traffic uh, lights, and so forth. So we ask you, please, with the vagueness of this plan, to, uh, to make a decision at this point would be premature, to take some time to really think and hopefully meet with other members of the community to give us a chance to voice concerns and to mitigate some of these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Susan Galbraith. I have been sworn in. I live in Manatee County, and I live in Normandy West. In fact, my back door will be 20, 75 yards from the new development. Currently, I'm not, when I moved in in 2015, I was told that there was going to be something there someday. And the property was up for sale then, and it had been up for sale for several years prior to that. Over the years, I have gotten used to the open land, to the, to the uh, animals that are around, and granted, I get the noise from 301, but what concerns me is four-story apartment building behind my home. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't sign up for that. Um, also, you're talking about an emergency room. I am a retired emergency room nurse, and I know the amount of traffic, the amount of noise, and I don't know if you are aware of this, but in the United States currently, we are 1.1 billion nurses short. We are 500,000 nurses are retiring this year. So you've got, you're building a facility where you may have less than desirable people working there or having a hard time trying to find nurses, PAs, and physicians. Even in physicians here in the state of Florida are in short. There are not enough. So you're now you're talking about building a facility with open to care for the patients, but at the same time, try to find staff to take care of that patient. 
but the noise level from a freestanding emergency room, you're going to have ambulances coming in. If you're going to transport them out, you're going to have ambulances going out with sirens all day long, 24 hours a day. It is going to impact upon our own well-being and our homes. My Also, my concern is I bought this as my final home. I moved from the state of Ohio, and I moved this for my final home. My property values are going to go down. I have seriously considered selling, but my, I'm not going to be able to get anything because of a four-story apartment complex behind me and an emergency room. I do hope that you will really consider the citizens that you serve and the citizens of Harrison Ranch and of Parrish because this is really going to impact us greatly. Thank you for your time. Anyone else? Oh, yep. <clears throat> Hi, I'm uh, Chris London, Manatee resident. I've been sworn in. Um, there's been some talk on the west side. I just want to put a little bit of light on the east um, side portion of this project. And what comes to mind to me is why would we put an ER so close to so many residents when there's so many other areas and options? Um, so you're talking about 320 apartment complex, all the homes that are there, and you look around Manatee County, and it's been touched on before, is, is the already approvals for the other um, hospital options. It just seems to me like why would you just poke a bear like that? Uh, on top of that, it hasn't even been discussed at all as far as helicopter, pad, noise, hasn't been touched on whether that's going to be part of this. And then on the east side also, just the established wildlife areas. It just seems like such an easy fix just to say, hey, let's just destroy these areas and, and we'll do a formula and we'll, we'll put it somewhere else. But what about the area that it's in currently? Isn't that what you want to look at? And past that, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hello, my name is uh, Gary Smith. I live in Manatee County, and I've been sweared in. Uh, the one question I have is how come a permit was given for site work to begin on Normandy East when no plan has been approved? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Anyone else in the public that would like to come forward and speak for or against this item. This will be, we'll be closing public comment. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Hespenhide. I'm a resident of Manatee County and I've been sworn in. Um, I just wanted to add that I also live in uh, Normandy West, and my backyard um, is directly um, <coughs> with uh, Harrison Ranch Road. Already, I get cars. The traffic has increased tremendously already with the work that they've been doing on the roads in the area. I've got lights coming in all hours of the day at night. Um, there's noise. They've already started some construction over on the Normandy uh, east side in terms of tearing out some trees and whatnot. And all I heard all day long was bang, bang, bang. And that's just a small sample of what we're going to get. Uh, if this is approved. Um, I'm also concerned because from my front of my house, my villa, is, is going to be this four-story apartment building. I can't imagine the traffic that is going to be added to that turn on to um, 
Harrison Ranch Road, it's already, you take your life in your hands if you try to make a left-hand turn to get out of the subdivision um, with the traffic on 301. Um, I don't, basically, we're being asked to, to buy a pig and a poke. I mean, we don't know what the heck is being proposed. Um, and I think that uh, the negative consequences on my community are very, very real, and uh, I hope that you will vote this uh, down. Please, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else in the public? When we close the public comment portion, that'll be the end. Just going once. Going twice. All right, we'll close the public comment portion. We'll have um, staff closing comments to start with. And while they're getting that together, um, <clears throat> maybe I can give a um, kind of a traffic has been something that's been talked about a lot. No, oh, sorry. <laughs> you guys need hearing aids back there or what? No, it's me. Actually, I have hearing aids because I'm deaf. I get it. I'm with you. So um, what, the, the, the traffic, the, the, and this is just kind of a layman's. I'm just trying to make it simple for me. There's 300,000 square feet of commercial presently approved there, right? Nothing happens. They go out there, build. That's a that's a Walmart and a half, just so you have some idea. Walmart's 200, 220,000 square feet, that kind of thing. So that's going to generate a number of trips, just a trip. It's a car moving. And I don't know what the number is. I don't care what the number is. Let's say it's 1,000, 100. It doesn't matter. What the land use equivalency matrix does is it says you, 300,000, and forget about the numbers, it doesn't matter. 300,000 square feet results in 1,000 trips, 500. I don't know what the number is. They can't exceed that. They can trade that. So instead of 300,000 square feet, I'm going to do 100,000 square feet, and I'm going to do um, some houses. But the end result is the number of cars moving on the grid doesn't change. So it's not going to get any worse. The number of cars is more or less fixed in place by the present development and the land use equivalency matrix. And now I'll let staff and or applicant tell me where I'm wrong and continue. So staff closing comments. Hi, Laura Gonzalez. Um, and I have been sore. Um, yes, you are right. This is the way that the land use equivalency matrix works. But I would, I would like also to point out that the section uh, regarding the freestanding emergency department in the land development code says uh, has certain requirements. One of them says, for example, that no heliport or heli stop shall be allowed. So I know that one of the um, neighbors was worried about it, but it, they won't be allowed. And also states that ambulance entrances and loading areas shall not be located in a yard, a booting residential zone or use property. So they, at time of the final site plan, they have to consider these um, conditions of the land development code for getting approval for the, to the final site plan of the free standing emergency department if they decided to do it. Um, what else? Uh, is th this is not a rezoning application. The, re the zoning district is PDMU, and this zoning uh, district allows the residential use. The thing is that the current ordinance is only only permit residential uses. So they are coming to the board asking for include the residential use and the freestanding emergency department. Um, Basically, this is what I have to say. Any question? Questions for staff. So, um, traffic study, <clears throat> TIS, traffic, in, in, traffic impact analysis, traffic study, either from the applicant or staff. I see Mr. I see Mr. Yates still here. Oh, oh sorry, all right. Well, no, no, no. We, we're staff now. If staff doesn't want to say it, st applicants can say it later. If needs to. At, let the applicant handle it. Uh, they All need right. to address it first, and then we can All right. address any other concerns. All right. So then we'll. 
All right, let's take this a little bit out of order, specifically for the purpose of talking about a traffic in either a TIA or TIS. So we'll take you slightly out of order. Let's talk about that, and then we can get response to that. Is that correct, Ms. Greer, generally speaking? Well, it's just the applicant's right. responsibility to, sh to give you that the answers. Way. Okay, all right, so. Hey, Steve Henry with Links and Associates. And I have been sworn. Uh, so we, we do have, we have done a traffic impact analysis. It has been approved a project for 300,000 square feet of commercial uses. It actually has a, a CLOS, a certificate level of service for this particular property. So we've already got th that entitlement already from a traffic standpoint, already approved CLOS. And so this with the matrix, as you had indicated, would not increase the traffic associated with, with already approved. Okay, your CLOS, your Certificate of Level of Service, yes, it has been approved previously. Yes. Correct. And its lifespan is when? Uh, we know. It, it's Usually typically three years. years from the date uh, right. that it's issued. I believe it's issued a year ago. It's so 2026 expires. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's get back now to um, staff closing comments. Anything? So there's a traffic study out there in Building Health. Um, the Eagle's Nest, uh, yes. So there's an Eagle nest, Eagle's Nest out there and there's um, state law requirements for when they can build, how they can build, the circles around and all that stuff. Yes, and I know that the applicant has their environmental consultant here as well, Kara Koenig for staff. Um, there is an Eagle's Nest located offsite. Um, there are the protection zones, the 330 and the 660 foot buffers that do extend onto this property, um, but they would just have to coordinate with U.S. Fish and Wildlife. So if they do construction activities within that area, they have to go by the bald eagle management guidelines and potentially obtain a permit. Okay, thank you. Um, staff, there was some comments about a pre-op conference and a neighborhood meeting. <coughs> do we know if there was or was not a pre-op conference and do we know if there was or was not a neighborhood meeting? Dan Greenberg for staff. Um, thanks. Uh, there was a question when I when I first came on board with uh, Manatee County. This was one of the earlier applications I got. Um, so looking to investigate what was investigated prior related to their request, just I, I followed up and asked, was there a pre-application conference? Um, it turns out they got a waiver for that because they were effectively, from their perspective, I'll let them speak to this obviously, but um, they had their pre-existing PDMU entitlement for 300,000, they're coming Answer is no, there was no pre-op conference. Correct. All right, what about a neighborhood meeting? I don't believe so. Okay, all right. Okay. Um, this is probably something for the applicant, but staff is not aware of any site work going on out there that is um, illegal or whatever that I'll we're aware that. of. That well, that's the applicant. Okay. Hey, oh, hold on. Can't, uh, don't worry, Will. Um, is there anything else for staff at this point? Okay. Applicant closing comments. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I want to I want to go back to kind of some of how we started here. This is an existing approved project. It is approved for 300,000 square foot of commercial. Um, there were comments about the height that was being requested. That is not a height that's being requested. That is the existing four stories is the existing approved height on that project. The site work that is being done on the site is for a three story self storage facility that has an approved final site plan. These are all things that are approved for the site and Okay, so there's I'm sorry. right. So let's just knock these off one at a time. So you obviously have existing zoning and a neighborhood, the warehouse fits within your neighborhood existing approvals. That's correct. No matter what we do today, you can build that thing. It's under construction, got a permit going ahead. Yes. All right. So that's the work that's going on out there, totally permitted and blah, blah, blah. That's All correct. Right. Thank you. Um, and so w when we look at coming in with the potential to convert to 
multifamily uses. I mean, we would typically think of that as being a less intense use than the commercial uses that are approved on the site. And that also goes to why we didn't have a, a pre-app meeting, the county waived that, and why we didn't have a neighborhood meeting. We didn't anticipate this kind of pushback on, on the multifamily uses as compared to the commercial on this site. Um, I wanna talk a little bit, if we could pull up our presentation again. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, I do wanna talk a little bit about the, <clears throat> get to the site plan. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the buffering because I know Commissioner Rutledge was asking about that and, and that is not something that, is, that has been left to final design. We have specific stipulations in this development order uh, that are actually existing, that are being slightly modified, but they're existing related to the buffering from the residential uses. And so what is proposed on that western parcel, which is, which is the area where you have single family adjacent, is a, well, there's a 15-foot greenbelt buffer. There is also an 8-foot wall on top of a 3-foot berm or a 12-foot wall. So one of those two will be provided in that location on the western parcel, and that is, that is what has been planned on this site because of the commercial uses. Mm -hmm. Similarly, on the eastern side, you will see, you see a large stormwater pond, right, on the northern portion of the property, and then to the east of that, there's a dark shaded area, right, that is existing uh, vegetated wetland that is going to be preserved and it will be maintained there as, as part of that buffer. And then as you go further to the, to the south down that, that uh, property line, that is their native preservation area that has existing mature trees and that is also being preserved for buffer. And then I'm gonna take you back around to the, to the top where that where that pond is along the roadway there, there is proposed an eight foot wall in that location as well. So that is significant buffering um, and separation that is, that is already being provided on this site because of the commercial uses. Um, and we think it, it continues to be appropriate now with the multifamily. Um, but again, that is something that is, the county's general commercial zoning allows for multifamily uses. So I think that is generally considered to be compatible and less intensive than the proposed commercial. That was the way that, that we viewed it. We think this is a very appropriate use for the site. This is a future four lane road and a six lane arterial intersection. This is going to be a major intersection in this county. Uh, the infrastructure is in place here and this type of development is appropriate. And with that, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that the commission may have. Thank you, Mr. Rudisell. Any questions for the applicant? So that was the first mention that I heard today that there is, I'm sorry, that there is the existing four stories is permitted. Does the staff agree with that as well? That there's four stories, they're all nodding yes. So it could be, Right now, today, it could be a four-story mini warehouse. We have them downtown all over the place, right? So um, so the four stories is currently permitted. So the debate really is not the height, but the use. Four stories is existing, permitted, whether it's a four-story mini warehouse or a four-story apartment. Now we're talking about the use, not the height. I believe that to be true. Okay. Um, and we talked about the permit for the site work. I believe that answers the question for the gentleman who was worried about it. It's permitted. It's part of what their existing uses are. <coughs> TIS. Um, someone, um, someone mentioned potential runoff, which is certainly a reasonable thing. There'll be silt fence around the perimeter. Possibly the applicants, um, if they have an environmental person here, they can talk about, or maybe J Mr. Mulock can talk about the nature of a silt fence and what it does or doesn't do. 
Sure, yeah. Uh, Jeb Mulock, ZNS Engineering, I have been sworn. Um, yeah, from the get-go of when the uh, construction activity would start and actually weeks prior to, there would be silt fence that would be installed. And the primary use of that uh, silt fence is to, um, you know, basically filter and uh, reduce sediment runoff from construction. So it's its primary purpose and, and it actually uh, is very effective. So that would be employed as well. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mulek. All right. We have two items before us, item number eight and item number nine. Are there any further comments for staff or applicant or Mr. Rutledge? Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to ask the staff. I mean, um, I hear the residents, but my experience, and I'd like to get your thoughts, is a residential zoning is a down zoning, and the choice of having commercial trucks deliver, trash delivered, and uninvited customers versus residents who live there is usually considered a benefit. And, and I'd like to hear what the staff says. I mean, I understand the logic to it. So I'm kind of curious why somebody would want a commercial site instead of residential. And we had this happen over at Lakewood Ranch where they wanted an industrial site instead of apartments. So I'd like to hear the logic of, of uh, urban planning or, or just land planning. I think several people could comment on this, mm -hmm. Professor. I'll uh, speak first and uh, happily uh, be helped out okay. if need be. Uh, Dan Greenberg for staff. Um, I, I think generally, and I may have misunderstood the question, I apologize, but uh, we're looking at this from the larger perspective of there is commercial entitlement there. So from sta at least the, I'll speak to the comprehensive plan first, and Laura can speak to the, the PDMU ordinance amendment. Um, it's at an activity node that it, that, that should be established as an activity node per staff's opinion of what the comp plan policies support. Um, given that we have established a principal arterial there and then an urban collector, uh, the comprehensive plan has numerous policies. I don't have it in front of me to, to read them, I apologize, but um, it generally supports activation of that node and turning it into what we would call an activity node, capital A, capital N, um, in that we, we try to encourage and facilitate mixed use development. It's not always appropriate. And, you know, at the comp plan level, we have to speak in generality sometimes, but that's the long and short of the um, intensification of this node and staff generally uh, believing that's in line with the policies of the comp plan. No. Un profesor. <laughs> okay. Uh, Nelson Galeano, Transportation Planning. And I have been served. Your question is um, related uh, to mixed use, and mm, is also related to the land use equivalent matrix because you are speaking about land uses and how they interact. And mm, <coughs> let me let me start speaking about uh, the one of the criteria that we have with the land use equivalency matrices, and this is the trip neutrality. That, that is the technical term. It means uh, uh, no matter how is the land use, we have a certain number of trips, and the idea is to be below this threshold, this number of trips. Uh, what happened with the land use equivalency matrix, and I go to the, to the residential and this type of other uh, land uses that can be or not complementary to the uh, residential, uh, say, commercial, or say the, the hospital, or say the offices, wherever. Um, the trips has uh, two, or two other uh, characteristics. One is the purpose, why we move, and the other is the length. When we have um, mixed use, the purpose is to, to have diverse trips in order that uh, our activities, we, we realize our, our activities in a small area, say, in that way. Um, the, the, we, we, go to, we go to work, we go to study, we go to recreate, we, we, we recreation. It means we, we have a, a, a different type of purposes. When our destination is very close to our, our um, home, the length of the trips is closer, it's, 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 it's shorter. Uh, the trip neutrality exists and maintains. However, the length of the trips enlarge. 
if we change the location of the, uh, our destination. That is, that is one of the things that the land use equivalent matrix is silent. Uh, in this case, in related to your question, uh, the, 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 the idea is to maintain uh, the mixed use. And that is the purpose of the land use equivalent matrix, to provide flexibility uh, to the developer in order to address market-driven conditions that current right now. Um, uh, the best example is um, uh, restaurants. Uh, and ask yourself when it was the last time you walked to a restaurant from your home. Uh, it, I believe it was years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially because uh, we don't have this land use diversity in mixed use areas that provide this type of trips. Shorter trips means uh, walkable, bikeable trips that uh, 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 no, doesn't congest. That's it. That is the, the way that I, 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 I want to address your question regarding uh, urban planning and transportation, which is related to the mixed use and the land use equivalent matrix. Claro. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Anything else for staff and or applicant? All right. We beat this one to death. Carol, entertain a motion. We're going to take them separately. Number eight is the um, comp plan. So we'll take them separately. <coughs> we have a motion. We have a motion and a second to approve. We may now vote. This is for the comp plan change. Motion is essentially five to one with one absten absten abstention, abstention, abstain, whatever that word is. So motion passes five to nothing for those sitting here. Number nine is the PDMU um, and We have a motion. <coughs> we have a motion and a second to approve. You may now vote. <coughs> motion again carries five to nothing. Both items pass. For those in the public, I'm sure you're not necessarily happy about this, but I think there's been a lot of discussion today about existing building height, existing uses, what a land use equivalent matrix is, and some of those things. And certainly you're free to talk to staff between now and um, the county commission meeting, and I'm sure the county commission will be happy to see you all whenever it goes to the county commission meeting. So thank you. All right, internally, let's see. Is there anything else on our agenda today? Um, Denise. Anything else from staff? Chairman, entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion carried. We are adjourned. <laughs>